Special meeting of the Leon County Board of County Commissioners called to order at uh, 6 p.m. sharp at, uh, on September 7th, 2021. As you know, this meeting has been called to receive updates regarding COVID-19 with presentations from county staff and medical and public health professionals and to evaluate mitigation measures. I want to thank each of you for, for being here. Um, at this presentation, at this uh, special meeting, I'll deliver the invocation and the pledge. So if you'd please stand. Let us pray. Father, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. We pray for those infected with the COVID-19 virus and for the family and medical staff who surround them in care. We pray for healthcare workers and people on the front lines of this disease, for workers who are in essential roles to keep this community going, keep them healthy, keep them safe. We pray for everyone struggling during these uncertain times. Give us all the strength, judgment, and serenity to persevere and to treat each other with compassion. We ask this in your name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, commissioners. At this special meeting, we have no items under awards and presentations or under consent, so I will hand it to the county administrator to introduce the updates regarding COVID-19. Mr. County Administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman, commissioners, good evening. Uh, as you all know, uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, Leon County has remained on the front lines of our community response and recovery efforts. Over the past 18 months, we um, have experienced waves of the virus. And uh, as you all know, we've transitioned from stay-at-home orders uh, to mitigate the spread of the virus to coordination and planning efforts to ensure the, avail the availability of healthcare resources, to rolling out large-scale testing and contact tracing strategies, uh, to aggressively promoting and distributing vaccines, and implementing a multi-phased uh, strategy to safely reopen our local economy, making data-driven decisions uh, throughout. Uh, and as recently as March of this year, we were down to zero COVID-19 patients in our local hospitals. However, as you all know, the Delta variant has surged nationwide. Uh, here in Leon County, our hospitalization rates reached all-time highs due to the Delta variant in recent weeks, but have peaked and are trending down at this time. Uh, we have implemented a model grassroots vaccine effort uh, to engage hard-to-reach communities, uh, working in concert with a very robust and comprehensive communications campaign. Our vaccination rate of 58% is not where it needs to be, uh, but we're making steady progress. Uh, and 18 months into the response effort, uh, commissioners, our county teams continue working around the clock uh, in coordination with our many community partners to address the pandemic on all fronts. Uh, and you'll hear uh, more about all of these efforts uh, today from uh, various speakers of, uh, uh, from county staff uh, that we have uh, on deck. Commissioners, last week you received a status update uh, by email uh, from me, which provided the latest public health metrics related to COVID-19, as well as a summary of Leon County's response and recovery efforts throughout the pandemic. As you saw in the status report, um, we continue working to coordinate healthcare resources, to respond to a heightened uh, volume of calls for emergency medical services, to build community-wide capacity for testing and vaccinations, uh, to conduct uh, extensive community outreach, uh, to reduce vaccine hesitancy, uh, distributing more than $130 million in federal recovery assistance, and so much more. Uh, as you know uh, from the many agenda items and updates that you've received over the past year and a half, commissioners, the level of effort uh, by the county uh, and the level of effort that we have placed into our response and recovery uh, has been immense. And I want to thank the board uh, for your consistent uh, uh, direction uh, throughout these past 18 months. Uh, and as we continue working to ensure the highest degree of coordination and collaboration uh, to meet the needs of our community. For today's meeting, commissioners, we have several speakers lined up, as I mentioned, to provide updates with the latest health metrics 
uh, and and the county uh, the county's response and recovery efforts. First, you'll hear from Matt Cavell, uh, who will provide an overview of where we are in the evolution of the pandemic, as well as the county's latest efforts to promote vaccinations and reduce vaccine hesitancy. Next, Alan Rosenzweig will give you a, a quick status update of our expenditure uh, plan for $57 million, uh, in American Rescue Plan funds uh, that the board approved during the May budget workshop. You'll hear from Shankton Lammy uh, about the various assistance programs that we continue to implement, including the emergency rental assistance program uh, and coordination efforts with our local health clinics. Uh, we will discuss measures that the county has taken to protect uh, health and safety of our citizens uh, and employees, including an update on call volumes and response efforts uh, in our EMS division. You'll hear directly from Chief Abrams on that. Our local hospitals have provided written statements for today, uh, and which have um, uh, been distributed to you and will be made part of the public record. Uh, both place a strong emphasis on our vaccination uh, efforts. Uh, our, uh, and you'll uh, hear from our, our health director today, uh, Claudia Blackburn, a health department director today. Uh, finally, our county attorney will provide an update on uh, recent emergency actions that other counties have taken uh, to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and to protect public health. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to hand it over to Matt Cavell at this time to get us started. And as always, uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Vince. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, um, my update is going to cover the 539 days of the Emergency Operations Center activation. So just buckle up and get ready. We're going to start at day one and just push through. Now, so for our activation of the Emergency Operations Center, it's been 539 days. It's been thousands of missions. It's been hundreds of different participants and agencies. But since the very beginning of the pandemic response to the county, it's been one purpose to address the needs, the emergent and urgent needs of the community. And that has not changed. While our activation and our purposes and our priorities may have been different each and every day, our purpose has remained the same. Starting in day one at the Emergency Operations Center, it was the coordination of some of the first few calls, which have amounted to more than 1,500 calls and 20,000 participants to date to present day. There's two things that we've learned from those coordinating calls with tens of thousands of participants. The first is that information sharing and coordination is one of the key components of emergency management that the county does to save lives. And the second one is that you're always going to be talking on mute when you first try to talk. Those are definitely some deliverables for the conference calls. Some of the other bits is day 60 after day one, we're out there delivering 1.7 million different pieces of PPE to frontline workers and to healthcare providers. In day 100, we're surge planning. We're walking around the Gasvini Center after our activation and thinking about how we run oxygen to different rooms and how we provide support for TMH and for Capital Regional Medical Center. And on day 170 of the activation, we're thinking about what hurricane season planning looks like and what does sheltering look like during a pandemic, all of which served us well even this year for Elsa and Fred. And day 220, which puts us into October, we're starting our early coordination of how we roll out the vaccine to make sure it gets to the people who need it most when it comes available. Just a few months after that, in day 270, we're sitting on the front lines giving out uh, vaccines to seniors, and we're coordinating the largest volunteer effort the county has ever done to conduct calls to seniors to make sure that they go to their scheduled appointments at the Florida Department of Health in Leon County. That brings us to day 500, which is just one month ago where we're conducting our most urgent and important hospital coordination calls with Capital Regional and with Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare. And we're making sure that they have no unmet needs to be able to serve the community. On those calls, which we've conducted since day one, most recently, their demand, their call is to collective action for our community to seek vaccinations, to get educated about it, and to find it where it's close by. That brings us to vaccine hesitancy, which is our biggest effort at day 539 and has been for the past seven months, is to ensure that we increase education about the vaccine, that we make sure that we have community advocates who look like the communities we need to serve and to reach, to make sure that we increase access to the vaccine by doing mobile vaccination clinics that have reached thousands, but by also providing translation services in Fort Braden for serving farm workers, that we are also um, increasing and educating uh, the whole family. 
doing whole family vaccine hesitancy outreach. All of this vaccine outreach is also part of the county's largest outreach effort to date of a scheduled and budgeted $1.5 million to do direct home outreach, reaching more than 26,000 households, and also generating thousands of vaccinations. And only can you do that if you are coordinating with folks like Dr. Lane Bryant and the local task force to, again, close that gap. As the county administrator has said, are we where we want to be? No. Are we making progress in closing that gap? Yes, we are. And we'll continue to do that effort as we continue to lead the county's largest communications effort to date for COVID-19. That has involved all forms of social media. That has involved hand-to-hand -hand outreach. It's involved special events. It's involved print communication and targeted outreach to the hardest to reach communities that we have. Now, all parts of those communications campaigns are also events in the public. Those events in the public that we've done have been COCA-related events. They've been county-also-supported tourism events, all of which have had to submit safety plans as part of their grant application, and all of which we would continue to recommend that all those partners follow the highest CDC and most current CDC guidance, which is, again, recommended masks within indoor spaces if you are fully vaccinated or unvaccinated. We would always encourage those partners to continue to follow that uh, as it continues to evolve and change over time. In addition, events in the county include the amphitheater space. The amphitheater space is operating under lesser capacity, spaced out lines, increased sanitation, and notifications to socially distance when you're able. The Outlook from all those 539 days is to say that operations change, but the purpose of the county and the urgent need of the community does not. We don't know what day 600 or 700 will mean, but we do know that we'll continue to meet the community where they need it, to continue to promote vaccinations, as all of our healthcare providers have flagged that as the most important effort that we can focus on. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Alan Rosenzweig to talk more. Thanks, Mac, and evening, Commissioners. I'm going to give a brief overview of our ARPA funding and where we're at at this time, and then I'm going to turn it over to Shinkton, who will drill in a little deeper on some of the specific programs we're at right now. Um, commissioners, you may recall back in May, we had a budget workshop where the board approved an expenditure plan of $57 million for the implementation of our ARPA funding. As a brief recap, the purpose of this funding was to address a wide variety of community recovery needs, particularly for individuals and businesses hit hardest by the pandemic. Specifically, commissioners, the plan you approved, and I'm going to read a little few things here, don't miss any, was to support our local vaccination efforts, which you've heard from Matt specifically. In addition, support our local business community, specifically including extending a micro loan program for MWSD businesses that the county initiated last year with your CARES funding. You built upon that, and we now have over $3 million in that program partnering with the city. We established a new round of nonprofit funding, which Mr. Lambie will give you some more details on in a minute. In addition, the ARPA funding, uh, was set up to address the unique impacts of the pandemic, commissioners, on low-income households in the community, including food and nutrition assistance, homelessness diversion and prevention services, housing services, legal services for households facing eviction, foreclosure, and much more. Finally, commissioners, your program also established to complete three major septic to sewer projects which were authorized under the Treasury rules for the use of these funds. Lastly, commissioners, we set aside and the board approved $25 million for our lost revenue that the board, which the county has experienced last year and this year, to help us balance the budget over the next two fiscal years, which was a result of the pandemic, that revenue loss. Specifically, this enables the county to maintain a balanced budget by avoiding any tax or fee increases, any further capital project reductions, or reductions in our workforce. Lastly, commissioners, we just submitted our first report to the Treasury on our county's expenditure plan. At the end of the first reporting period, which is July 31st, we've obligated 43.8 million of our funds for about 77%. Um, the, the remaining 23% as was outlined in the memo the administrator gave you, gave you was about 12 million set aside for next year for revenue loss. In addition, we have a small amount of reserve left, about a million dollars. And again, just to toot our horn a little, you'll be hearing from Shinkton about our ERA program and all our other assistant programs, but we wanted to mention that as you've seen in weekly updates and something we wanted to highlight here again is that we are the, the number one county in the state of Florida for distribution of ERA funds. You've heard a lot of comments throughout the country of people not getting the ERA funds out. That's not the reality in Leon County. 
We've been recognized for that, and Shinkton will give some more details. So with that as a very brief overview, I'm going to ask Shinkton to come up and provide some more specifics on the programs and the metrics. Mr. Lamy. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, through our various assistance programs that I will highlight tonight, we continue to actively engage our local human service partners in response to the economic and health impact of the pandemic for our most vulnerable populations in Leon County. There are four specific efforts that I'd like to focus on. Um, one, as Alan mentioned, our efforts to prevent the eviction of Leon County residents from their home, from evictions from their homes through the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, our partnership with the Big Bend Continued Care, or COC, and homeless service providers to prevent the spread of the virus in our homeless population, our tireless work with our fairly qualified, uh, our fairly qualified healthcare partners, and the health department to provide access to COVID-19 testing throughout the community and our continued support to local human service providers to address ongoing needs that have been exacerbated uh, by the onset of the pandemic. First, I'll begin with emergency rental assistance. As you know, commissioners, we have assisted over 2,900 low-income households with rent, utilities, and internet costs through our emergency rental assistance program that launched in March, totaling more than $14 million in awards. This, of course, is in addition to more than 4,900 households that were assisted last year with past due rent, mortgage, and utilities for a total of $11.4 million with the federal coronavirus relief funds. Last week, Leon County was recognized by the Florida Housing Coalition at their annual conference as one of only three local governments that significantly outperformed in our efforts to distribute COVID-19 relief funds last year to renters and homeowners. With ERA funds, we are one of the top 10 local governments nationally in the distribution of the proportion of allocations we received and, as I mentioned, number one in the state of Florida. We continue to assist citizens um, with submitting required documents for their, for their applications and processing payments for rent, utilities, and internet costs. Let me turn over to homelessness now. We're working daily with the COC and our local homeless service providers to address the adverse impact of COVID-19 on individuals and families experiencing homelessness. Over the past year and a half alone, we have convened the COVID-19 Local Homeless Task Force to, co to coordinate emergency response and mitigation. We partnered with the Salvation Army to open, to open an emergency community relief center for unsheltered individuals. We established and, and continue to fund non congregate sheltering for homeless individuals and families experiencing homelessness that have been diagnosed by, with COVID-19 or are awaiting testing and we provided $2.1 million in CARES Act funding to homeless service um, shelter providers in our community. As part of the ARPA funding, the county and city jointly provided approximately $6.3 million for homeless support to expand street outreach services and other services, including increased permanent supportive housing. A portion of those funds will also be utilized by homeless shelter providers to support unanticipated expenses incurred due to COVID-19. Contracts with those agencies um, are being executed and the providers will begin re receiving their funds shortly. In July, the board held, held a joint workshop with the city on homelessness, at which time the board approved contracting with the COC for specific programs like outreach, like permanent, support, permanent supportive housing. We are finalizing the contracts with the COC this week so we can begin executing the, that contract. Consistent with the plan present to the board, presented to the board at the joint workshop, all contracts are expected to be fully executed and in place later this month. And funds for, service, for, for, for services like street outreach and capacity building will dis, be distributed later this fall. As I mentioned earlier, the county provided $2.1 million in CARES Act funding to our homeless service 
provide us to expand their services and make renova renovations to their, to their facilities. Both the Kearney Center and Hope Community have completed significant renovations to their facilities to meet CDC guidelines for operation. And that includes enhancing their HVAC system, installing automatic doors, and constructing outdoor dining areas. We are currently coordinating with the shelters to schedule dates and times in which the board could safely tour the improvements that have been made due to the county's care funding investment. I'll turn now to health care. Our FQHC's Bond Community Health Center and Neighborhood Medical Center continue to be critical partners in our COVID-19 response efforts through testing, vaccination, and community outreach. For more than a year now, we've held weekly meetings with our FQHCs and the health department to coordinate COVID-19 testing events. The county allocated $1.1 million to the healthcare partners to provide, um, to provide to conduct COVID-19 testing events in the community. These events have been held at Leon County Branch Libraries, at churches, and even at county parks. Since July 2020, the healthcare providers have administered more than six thousand tests at more than 100 county funded events. Additionally, bond and neighborhood have been instrumental in the county's vaccination hesitancy efforts by participating in outreach campaigns and administering COVID-19 vaccines at county sponsored events like some of the ones Matt mentioned. In coordination with the health department, bond and NMC regularly hold vaccination events at health at homeless shelters churches, and other community locations. Since the spring of this year, Bond and Neighborhood have administered more than 8,000 COVID-19 vaccines. And we're continuing to support Bond and Neighborhood with ARPA fundings in the amount of $800,000 to make needed improvements to their facilities that are within neighborhoods that have been identified by the health department as threat areas in our fight against COVID-19. These funds will help them make those enhancements to their buildings so that way they can increase access to primary mental and dental care as well as provide services in the area of COVID-19. In July, our community was awarded a $1 million grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The grant application was submitted by neighborhood and um, collaboration by the county, Bond, and Big Ben Cares. Over the next year, the county will be working with neighborhood and the healthcare providers that I mentioned to utilize the funds to increase access to COVID-19 vaccination in minority neighborhoods through community outreach events that will be developed and implemented in conjunction with churches, minority businesses, and our human service and nonprofit partners in our community. Speaking of our human service providers and our nonprofits, the actions that the board has taken over the past year have recognized the importance of our human service providers and nonprofits to address the needs of residents impacted by COVID-19. In the past year, we have distributed more than $600,000 in lien funding through OEV to nearly 270 nonprofit agencies, distributed more than $1.8 million in Leon Cares Human Services grant funding to more than 120 agencies, distributed more than $2.6 million in Leon Care's nonprofit assistance grant funding to more than 180 agencies, allocated $4 million to address food insecurity, and allocated almost $1 million for child care assistance to households impacted by COVID-19. To build on this commitment, the county and city have jointly invested ARPA fundings for the next two to three years in the amount of $1.4 million to address food insecurity that will provide approximately 722,000 additional meals in the community, increase access to nutrition, nutritious foods, and build a capacity of small community pantries in some of our rural neighborhoods. We're providing more than $800,000 for legal services to expand resources to low-income households and um, households that are at risk to eviction and foreclosure. $200,000 to continue to provide mental health navigators at 211 Big Ben to triage mental crisis calls to appropriate providers in the community. 
and another $3 million for nonprofits through the Nonprofit Services Grant that provides up to $20,000 for services to Leon County residents impacted by COVID-19. Quite a lot. But with the Nonprofit Services Grant, I want to talk a little bit about the fact that we are partnering with UPHS, um, COCA, which is the Council on Cultural Arts, the United Way, and any to, to provide technical support to the agencies as they navigate through their application process. They've been very instrumental and great partners throughout this process. We've received more than 280 applications. That's how many applications that were submitted through the Nonprofit Services Grant. And approximately 150 nonprofits were notified a couple of weeks ago now that they were approved for funding. Over the next couple of weeks, we will be entering contracts with those nonprofit assistants, uh, for those nonprofit agencies as is required by federal guidance for services such as after school programming, healthcare, and job and life skill training. The agencies are expected to expend those funds over the next two years to respond to the needs of Leon County residents impacted by COVID-19. And with that, I will turn it back over to the County Administrator. Thank you, Shankton. Commissioners, as you know, we gave uh, Shankton a real heavy lift upon our, on his part of the presentation, but it's just, it reflects the sheer volume of the human services work that's been ongoing throughout, as, as you all know well uh, by this point. Commissioners, let me just talk a little bit more uh, about some of the steps that Leon County government has taken over the past few months to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Uh, and we'll continue uh, to talk a little bit more about, uh, about the public health um, aspects of this as we round out this presentation. Again, you'll be hearing from Chief Abrams in a moment, and then, and then Claudia Blackburn um, and, and, and Chastity will close for us on some of the issues that we talked about earlier in terms of what other counties are doing. Uh, but commissioners, as an essential government agency, Leon County is obligated, as you know, not only to ensure our operational readiness to serve the community, but also to protect the health and safety of the citizens that we serve. And to that end, from the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, Leon County has followed expert public health guidance with respect to face coverings, temperature screenings, and county operations. On July 27th, the CDC updated its mask guidance for fully vaccinated individuals. In short, to maximize the protection uh, from the Delta variant and, and to prevent possibly spreading it to others, the updated CDC guidance recommended wearing a mask indoors in public if you are in an area of substantial or high transmission, which of course includes Leon County. Accordingly, uh, immediately after the CDC revised its mask guidance, I directed all county employees, both vaccinated and unvaccinated, to once again wear masks when indoors and unable to socially distance. All county employees are also required to conduct temperature checks and health screenings when reporting to work. Uh, shortly after that, on July 30th, as you know, Chief Judge uh, Sorchum ordered a, uh, an order requiring face coverings for all persons, um, public and employees, uh, at the Leon County Courthouse. For citizens using other county facilities, we've posted signage recommending that citizens wear masks when indoors. Uh, and unable to socially distance, consisting with, consistent with the CDC guidance. Um, according to the feedback uh, that I've received from county work areas, the vast majority of visitors already follow the public health guidance or do so readily uh, when asked. Uh, and finally, commissioners, as you know, on July 28th, Leon County became the first local government in, in the nation and one of the first employers in the country to require all employees to become vaccinated uh, against COVID-19 as required by the Federal uh, Equal Employment Opportunity uh, Commission and, and, and um, as they've interpreted the laws, reasonable, uh, reasonable accommodations are available to employees uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, those include medical, uh, as you know, as well as um, uh, certain religious accommodations. Uh, again, as a frontline provider of essential government services, it's our responsibility to make every effort to prevent the spread of the virus uh, and virus outbreaks that could have been avoided so that we can maintain uh, continuity of operations and uh, organizational readiness to respond to the needs of our community. All of our employees are required to provide uh, documentation of vaccination by October 1st, and um, I expect uh, that we will uh, receive near 100% uh, compliance on that or very close to it. Uh, with that, Commissioners, I will hand it off to Chief Abrams. 
Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide you with an update on EMS operations during COVID. Um, before I get too deep in my comments, in addition to thanking each of you and county administration for your leadership, can't help but thank and recognize the county team that supports us in our response uh, efforts, and specifically the EMS team for answering the call to service and reliably delivering our mission uh, to our neighbors during some of the most difficult circumstances we've certainly ever faced. This has been a unique year and a half for everyone and a difficult time for many in our community. And I'm proud of the way that our members and our organization and community have responded some, to some difficult uh, and uncertain times. Since March of 2020, EMS has responded to just over 13,000 patients uh, that were suspected of having COVID at the time of dispatch. Um, and overall, our team has done an outstanding job in response to this pandemic. I was reminded by our leadership team that we started preparedness activities for the pandemic in, Mar in February of 2020 and responded to our first COVID incidents in March. The key to our success has been the exceptional members of our team that care deeply for this community and want nothing but the best for our citizens and our organizational relationships with community partners. Our focus has been on delivering the very best care available while protecting our patients and their families and safeguarding our members. In response to the pandemic, we've instituted uh, member health screening since uh, very early in the pandemic in March. Um, we've worked with a consolidated dispatch agency to implement an emerging disease uh, screening tool that helps us identify instances where responders need to be additionally protected with personal protective equipment. We've leveraged our partnerships with uh, the Department of Health to have access to PCR testing for our EMS members which, since the very beginning of the pandemic, which has helped us keep our members available to respond. We've required mandatory surgical masks or N95 respirators and enhanced personal protective equipment used by our members and required patients and families to use uh, appropriate face coverings uh, as appropriate which is consistent with all of our pandemic uh, preparedness activities. In addition, our preparedness activities ensured that we've had an adequate supply of FDA and NIOSH approved N95 respirators and personal protective equipment. Um, so we, while we have developed steps to institute contingency plans, we have not used any of those plans. Um, we've never asked any of our EMS members to go unprotected or use any personal protective equipment um, that's being used under an emergency use authorization. We've made physical improvements to ambulances to help limit exposures, implemented new disinfection technology, uh, provided support and assistance at testing sites. Our highly infectious disease transport team has conducted several Department of Health missions. Uh, we've developed plans and implemented COVID non-transport protocols to assist with hospital surge and alternative treatment site planning um, should that need arise. Our medical directors modified medical protocols, treatment options, medical equipment uh, to improve what we do for our patients and to protect our members. We've implemented regularly scheduled department teleconferences and issued numerous uh, guidance documents to members to ensure availability of best information. We've assisted the Florida Department of Health with vaccination clinics. Our paramedics have administered thousands of vaccines. And our staff continuously worked with community partners, our healthcare providers, um, and others to ensure that we're aligning our resources to make the best, best impact we can for the community. Our team's resilience through it all has been admirable. Um, EMS has proven to be innovative, adaptable, capable, and resilient resource that has met many needs in our community. But not just in response to this pandemic, but in response to everyday needs of our uh, neighbors. Heart attacks, strokes, accidents, and medical emergencies continue even during a pandemic. And I just want to remind everyone of our accomplishments despite the pandemic or in addition to all those efforts with the pandemic. We continue to improve our peer support and member well-being program uh, to help our members cope with the pandemic and everyday pressures of their job. We continue uh, to provide exceptional care to our, our patients and outperformed cardiac arrest resuscitation goals and exceeded national standards for the care of heart attack, stroke, trauma, sepsis, um, which improves survivability and long-term patient outcomes. We implemented a state-of-the-art pediatric medication dosage system to improve accuracy of medication administrations. We continue to participate in important research projects with major universities, including the uh, FSU College of Medicine. We continue to update protocols to adopt best practices 
and we conduct a press of chess through an alternative virtual format. Now, with high levels of community transmission driven by the Delta variant, EMS calls for service are certainly higher uh, right now this year compared to 2020. If you compare the same 15-week period this year to last year, requests for service are 14% higher. But more specifically, in the last five weeks, it, uh, there's been a 26% increase in calls for service. We are seeing that stabilize. That number's not continued to go up. Um, so we're, we're hoping that that's uh, a, a continued trend and not just a statistical anomaly. Um, but August was certainly the busiest month we've ever had uh, as Leon County EMS with responses. And we continue to see a variety of very sick COVID patients, mostly unvaccinated. Um, other COVID-related incidents, uh, along with our traditional EMS responses, and the worried well, or people that have hesitancy about seeking health care because of their concerns about COVID. Uh, we've committed every available resource to staffing ambulances and delivering services to our citizens. We continue to get ambulances on the scene of emergencies quickly with an average countywide response time of 8 minutes and 30 seconds. Remember, that's the ambulance response time, and in serious emergencies and in instances where an ambulance response may be delayed, our emergency response partners from the Tallahassee Fire Department, the volunteer fire departments, and law enforcement agencies are also responding and providing care as quickly as possible. We continue to work with emergency management and the Florida Department of Health in Leon County, along with the area hospitals and our other first responders to plan for medical surges and improve hospital EMS offload times and coordinate patient movements. Commissioners, I can't overemphasize the remarkable efforts of our EMTs and paramedics um, alongside our emergency response partners, healthcare and community partners in responding to this pandemic. Their efforts have positively impacted thousands of citizens and their families um, as they continue to serve this community throughout these challenging times. I'm going to hand it over to Claudia Blackburn, the director of the Florida Department of Health and our partner in this effort. Good evening, commissioners. It's been a while since I've seen you. Um, this evening, I'm going to um, be turning this presentation over to Charmaine Anderson. And before I do that, I just want to um, make a comment. Um, so this it's been just an incredibly difficult 18, 19 months. I've kind of lost track. But, you know, there's always that opportunity that comes with a crisis, and one of those opportunities for the health department has been um, the opportunity to develop the public health workforce, which has been in uh, need for the last several years. And we are fortunate because we have two Masters of Public Health programs here in town, one at FAMU, one at FSU, and we have been able to recruit an incredible team of investigators and epidemiologists. One of those is Charmaine Anderson. Um, she has been with us for two years. She leads the COVID team of 30, including herself. And so we kind of refer to her as the COVID czar. They have investigated over 40,000 cases. And so they really, they've heard it all. They know their stuff. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Charmaine. Good evening, commissioners. Um, so I'll be giving a brief COVID-19 update, um, going over some of the numbers. Please note that this information was current at the time that the presentation was created. Um, of course, you all know with rapidly changing nature of COVID-19, some information such as statistics, dates, and times of testing and vaccinations may um, change after this. So from the beginning of this pandemic, our COVID-19 mission was and still is um, to protect, promote, and improve the health of all people in Florida through integrated state, county, and community efforts, as well as interview, evaluate, and monitor individuals who are sick with COVID-19 or who have been exposed to COVID-19, along with providing education, guidance, and isolation slash quarantine parameters based on CDC guidance. So in terms of our new cases and positivity rate by week, looking from June 2021 to September of 2021, 
you can see based on the graph in front of you, we did hit a low mark at the beginning of June. However, leading into August, we experienced our highest surge um, that we have experienced since the beginning of this pandemic. We are seeing a downward trend, which is good news for all of us, and it looks as though we are um, beginning to plateau with our most recent positivity rate from last week's state report being at 10.5% for the previous week. In terms of testing, testing is available at the following locations. We have a testing site at the DOH Leon Administration Building located at 2965 Municipal Way. This testing site is run by Nomi Health Labs and it runs seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. in an effort to allow everyone to have access to testing before or after work for those who are employed. Um, we also have a site at Huntington Oaks slash Lake Jackson Library. That site is located at 3840 North Monroe Street. This testing site is also run by Nomi Health Labs. Once again, it runs from seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Along with um, the testing site at FAMU, Testing is available through primary care providers as well as CVS and Walgreens. It is important to note that if tests are administered too early in the course of the virus, results may come back as negative. And at that point, we would recommend that a second test be performed in order to show pre presence of the virus. In terms of our, of our vaccinations, we are currently at a total of 58% of our Leon County population being vaccinated. As of last Friday, we are at 155,011 individuals having received their vaccinations. We do know that there are talks about a third dose. Currently, CDC recommends um, an additional vaccine dose for people with moderately to severe compromised immune systems, um, they are recommending that they receive an additional dose of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine at least 28 days after their second dose of either Pfizer or Moderna. Um, according to the CDC, people with moderately to severely compromised immune systems are especially vulnerable to COVID-19 and may not build the same level of immunity to the two-dose vaccine series compared to people who are not immunocompromised, which is why the third dose is currently being recommended for those who are immunocompromised. Likewise, this additional dose is intended to improve immunocompromised people's response to their initial vaccine series. We are currently offering monoclonal antibody treatment. Um, treatment is available at the following locations. We have one site at Sears at Governor Square Mall, located on 1500 Appalachie Parkway. This site opened on August 27, 2021, and as of September 2nd, the site has provided 500 treatments. The second site is CDR Health Tallahassee, located at 1981 Capital Circle Northeast, um, Tallahassee, Florida. Lastly, our public health mitigation strategies, we are still recommending mask, social distancing, and hand washing. According to CDC, you should wear your mask indoor in indoor public places if you are not fully vaccinated and age two or older, or if you are fully vaccinated and in an area of substantial or high transmission to maximize protection from the Delta variant and prevent possibly spreading it to others. Along with social distancing, we are recommending that you social distance inside your home. Um, we are recommending that you avoid close contact with people who are sick. Um, and then outside of your home, put six feet of distance between yourself and people who don't live in your household. And then lastly, the golden standard of hand washing. Um, we are recommending along with the CDC that you wash your hands often with, of course, soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after you have been in a public place or after blowing your nose, coughing and sneezing. And that is all I have for today. I'll bring Claudia. Thank you, commissioners. Um, to Chastity. 
Commissioners, uh, for the and, and thank you um, both. Uh, commissioners, for the final portion uh, of our presentation, uh, the county attorney, Chessie is. Thank you, Vince. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. So um, what I'm going to try to do is give you an update on the legal front because some things have changed since last year. Most notably, the legislature uh, enacted uh, some changes to the statutes. Specifically, a new subsection 4 was added to section 252.38. Okay? What this new subsection says is if, uh, well, one, it defines what emergency order means. So whatever we call it locally, whether it's an ordinance, a proclamation, an order, whatever, as long as it meets the definition in the statute of an emergency order, then the parameters that are in that statute now apply to any action taken by this board, okay? So one of the things is if it is an order or ordinance enacted in response to an emergency that limits rights or liberties of individuals or businesses within the political subdivision, so for us, the county, and it's not weather-related, those actions are now subject to what's called strict scrutiny, okay? So for those who probably may not know exactly what that means, it establishes a very, very high legal standard if any action of this board is challenged, okay? It has to be the, the action or a judge would have to find that the action was narrowly tailored to serve a compelling public or safety purpose, okay? So this sort of strict scrutiny is usually reserved uh, when there's an allegation that a law violates a fundamental right, like procreation or marriage, uh, or there's a constitutional equal protection uh, challenge, like a discrimination on the basis of race, national origin, religion, uh, and alienage, or there was a protected act like political speech, okay? So the other thing about strict scrutiny is there is a presumption uh, that uh, the burden is on the government if it's challenged. So, so if someone challenges an action of this body and it triggers the strict scrutiny, the burden isn't on the plaintiff to prove that it wasn't narrowly tailored to serve a compelling public health or safety purpose. That burden is on the county, okay? Um, so this is a bit of a paradigm shift from last year um, because when our uh, mask ordinance was challenged, that wasn't the finding of the trial court. Okay, but the legislature has changed what that legal standard now is. Okay, uh, and there's even the first DCA case that basically effectively now says the same thing. It was issued in June, the Green versus Alachua County case. Okay, and that's binding precedent on this circuit anyway. All right, so um, a couple of things to keep in mind for any of these emergency orders, and again, this goes back to what's now in section. 252.38, subsection 4, anything that we do that constitutes an emergency order expires in seven days unless the board meets and a majority of the members present vote to extend it, okay? At the outset, the longest one of these orders can be in place is 42 days. That's it, okay? The governor can also choose to just invalidate it at any time if he or she determines that uh, the emergency order unnecessarily restricts individual rights or liberties. And upon expiration, the political subdivision is prohibited from issuing a substantially similar order, okay? That's the way the statute now reads. 
Again, that's substantially different from what we were looking at last year. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions the board may, may have about that, but I thought I should start out with that piece to clear up any confusion because even in some of the comments, they were referring to some executive order that they think still exists that impacts the board's ability to take action. Uh, the last emergency order that the governor issued related to the state of emergency expired June 26. So there is no emergency order of the governor in place right now. It's strictly statutory. Okay, that emergent that that governor's state of emergency order expired the same day that the public health emergency expired. Okay, neither one of those has been in place since June 26. Thank you. Commissioners, um, so to conclude, let me just again uh, thank you all uh, for your consistent leadership, really your unwavering support uh, throughout this pandemic over the 18 or 19 months, as Claudia mentioned earlier. Um, it it uh, has meant everything and literally uh, nothing that you heard uh, today would have been possible without that. And so we greatly appreciate all of that. Mr. Chairman, that concludes our presentation we're happy to answer any questions you might have. I'll just note that we have six uh, in-speaker, uh, in-person speakers, and we've got about 15 Zoom speakers joining us, but I'm hearing we only have a handful actually on uh, tonight. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll take your lead. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. County Administrator, uh, for the very uh, comprehensive update uh, from county staff as well as our partners. Why don't we go ahead and, and do the, uh, the the speakers first? Could you please introduce the uh, the first speaker, sir? Uh, first speaker, Drew McLeod. I, I guess I would ask whether or not it's really fair to speak before I have any idea of what the commissioners are thinking. Do we get any response to that, or no? Okay. Well, Mr. McLeod, I, it's like um, we can have speakers first before we have a discussion and and have any uh, actions, or we can or we can actually have discussion and and, and have a, a motion or some type of actions discussed first, and then speakers speak. So, okay, it's it's we can't have a perfect either way, right? Okay. Well, obviously, the the meeting was called for emergency purposes by Commissioner Dozier to and thank you all for being here and listening to me. My name is Drew McLeod. I own Save a Restaurant at 115 East Park Avenue, making it more difficult. Uh, as duly elected officials, I think it's understood that, uh, you know, you represent us, and it's not the other way around. Uh, pardon me when I put my glasses on. And I think it's important that you listen, and we've talked about this before at other meetings. Um, some others didn't. They no longer sit among you. For the past year and a half, businesses, particularly the hospitality industry, have suffered greatly. I closed for seven weeks last year, but others closed for months and others permanently. In spite of financial help from the PPP or Leon Cares grants or otherwise, just to name a few, Carlos Cuban Grill, Barnaby's, Arapana, Marie Livingston's, Backwoods Bistro, Wells Brothers, Chi Chi's, Mellow Mushroom, Barbaritos, Nick's, Spirit, Fire Betty's, Finnegan's Wake, Fifth and Thomas, Fox and Stag, Flying Bear, a la Provence, Nefetari's, I can go on. Those are just restaurants that have lost uh, their businesses, families that have been severely affected economically. I feel, and many others in my industry and friends and family that I've talked to, feel like people need to govern themselves. And quite honestly, people do. When they come into my restaurant, many are wearing masks. I don't stop them from wearing masks. I give my staff a choice. Do you want to wear a mask? You're welcome to wear a mask. So I think when we take away the liberties of the few, it's not the answer. Even when some are living in fear, we need to be discerning. Survival rates continue to be north of 97%. That's a fact. We're being conditioned to believe our personal freedoms are selfish through virtue signaling. Efficacy is another issue. You know, we went from 14 days to flatten the curve to mask mandates to you don't have to wear a mask of vaccinated to vaccinating and wear a mask to wearing two masks to booster shots. Now three, when will it be four? 
I'm not saying the virus isn't real. I've had family and friends that have been affected by it. But if you're scared, get vaccinated, wear a mask or two. Stay at home, protect yourself if you have immunocompromised circumstances with your health. I don't think anyone here is opposed to, uh, you know, businesses making their own decisions about whether they sh people as, you know, guests or customers should uh, have the right to refuse people who aren't wearing a mask. Uh, but again, I think it's difficult to say. I'd like to know who's enforcing the ordinance so you can ask these questions. Didn't work before, Governor DeSantis shut it down, no fines. Do you expect us to enforce it? I'm certainly not a police officer. Um, you know, I don't know about the football game yesterday, but it was certainly no masks involved. And lastly, and I appreciate you giving me just one second, you know, the way I think about it is we cannot play God. There's not things that we can do other than virtue signaling. Thank None you of you can save fun. lives, but you can kill businesses as you have in the past. And I'd really appreciate you considering Mr. that. Thank you very to much. Put a mask mandate Thank you very much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Next speaker, Dr. Rick Kuyper. Uh, before I get started, um, I, I just wanted to know which of those cameras, I guess it's that one now. Okay, that's the camera that people are going to be able to see. Okay, because I want to share some information for those uh, that are joining us uh, through Zoom and uh, elsewhere on the Internet. Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Piper, please yes. state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Dr. Rick Kuyper. I'm a uh, uh, Leon County resident, 818 Shannon Street. I'm a retired special agent with the FBI where I served for more than 20 years. I have four advanced technical degrees, including two masters and a PhD. In addition, I hold more than a dozen technical certifications in the field of cybersecurity and digital forensics. Because I did not know exactly which mitigation measures you intend to impose on our com community, I'm only prepared to generally comment on the so-called COVID-19 pandemic and mitigation measures that have failed in the past. As a professional researcher and investigator, I will stick to the facts and provide my sources. I hope everyone with a microphone today will do the same. Anyone who cites CDC guidelines as the primary reason for imposing a community mandate is not being honest about following the science. The CDC has changed its guidelines so often it's become a meme. So has Tony Fauci of the NIH. To the extent the CDC does publish actual data, it directly contradicts their published guidance about the seriousness of COVID-19 virus and how to prevent it. I'll give you three examples of this. For each example, I created a QR code so you can easily get to the website and check the facts. Example number one. Under the comorbidity section of their website, the CDC reports a total of nearly 630,000 COVID-related deaths in the United States as of today. However, in the paragraph above that data, the CDC explains, quote, for over 5% of these deaths, COVID-19 was the only cause mentioned on the death certificate. For deaths with conditions or causes in addition to COVID-19, on average, there are 4.0 additional conditions or causes per death. In the column, in the table column titled Conditions Contributing to Deaths Where COVID-19 Was on the Death Certificate, they list 20 additional causes of death, including hypertensive diseases, uh, diabetes, obesity, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and so on. What does that mean? It means that for 95% of the 630,000 reported COVID-related deaths, only 5% or 31,500 deaths have been attributed to COVID only. I also refer you to the bottom of that same CDC table, which reports that only uh, 1,431 Americans under the age of 25 have died from COVID-related illness. That means that according to the CDC, Americans under the age of 25 account for only one-fifth of 1% 1 of all the COVID-related deaths. And using the CDC's own 5% statistic, only 72 Americans nationwide under the age of 25 have died from COVID only. And yet the CDC wants universal masking for everyone. Example number two, as you may know, the CDC also maintains the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, which contains voluntary reports of adverse events due to vaccines from the year 1990 to the present. I'm just going to summarize now because I'm running out of time. But uh, you can see that over the past 20 years, 44,281 deaths in li and life-threatening adverse actions due to all vaccines. Of that number, 29,699 deaths or life-threatening illnesses were due to the COVID vaccines. And I'm out of time. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for coming. Next speaker, please.
The next speaker is Whitfield Leland III. Mr. Leland, thank you very much for being here. Please state your name, name and address for the record. You have three minutes. My name is Whitfield Leland III. Um, my address is 2035 Hollow Creek Trail. Um, as you all are aware, um, I signed um, you guys' letters um, talking about um, the vaccination rate. I sat here and I heard all the wonderful, really, um, we lacking in education. Um, I uh, had a, a meeting and um, sat in on the phone with some kids and to hear, hear them talk about um, COVID and the misinformation, the misdirection. Um, and I, I have challenged us to, to sit down and to really address the public on really what COVID is, what the shot does, what the shot doesn't do. Because like I said, at the end of the day, Everything that they, everything that the people in my community, and I'm talking about the black community, everything that they're reading, it is all opinionated. And the people who you do have reaching in those communities, they do not have relationships with the people that you need to make contact with. At the end of the day, I do think that we take it a step further because even on the school board side, like we've been fighting to mandate masks, there's a serious problem with the way those kids have to quarantine if they catch COVID. At the end of the day, I do feel like it's really not too much you can do if they're not going to do digital school. But at the same time, if we put mask, if we meant if they're mandatory masks in school, we need the mandatory masks in Leon County. Only because if they leave school, they're still in an open population where nobody's wearing masks. The whole thing is wide open. The numbers are up. We do know that. When we did mandate masks, we didn't have these many cases and the numbers wasn't this high. So compared to what everybody say, this CDD, CDC, this, if we got three kids in ICU. It's, I, I, it, the number is low, but we shouldn't have not one. And as I said in my letter, man, the areas that we need to reach, man, we have individuals that, that's willing to do it. Um, I will say that, um, and some of my efforts, um, Mrs. Uh, Sheila, her team, and Marcus West, they do do what is necessary to make sure that we reach those people in those communities. So um, I did want to make sure that I get that um, out and let they have. But we need to do more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Leland. Uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker, Stanley Sims. Mr. Sims, thank you for being here, sir. Would you uh, please uh, state your name and address for the record when you get up to the podium, and you have three minutes, sir. It's all right, sir. Take your time. My name is um, Stanley Sims. I live at 1320 Avondale Way. I'm a father, black business owner, civil rights activist, part-time gator locator, full-time unelected county commissioner at large. So many Americans have died fighting for their freedom. Dr. Martin Luther King died fighting for his freedom. John F. Kennedy died fighting for his freedom. And I don't believe when the architects come together and form the Constitution of these great states, they meant that freedom was if a virus can kill, not just in the United States, but globally, then wearing a mask is, is obstruction 
as hanging black people for the right to vote. I'm appalled. I am appalled when I see individuals want to use freedom when my forefathers who built that capital that was invaded on January 6th by so-called freedom fighters. In my father's days, they were called Klansmen. I've got three kids up there that I see you. I don't even know their names. I don't know. All I know is two is black and it doesn't matter because it could have been my friend up there. This is nothing to play with, people. This is serious. And in the words of Mr. Dow Jones, I was deliciously proud to see my county administrator on CNN News. And if you want to talk about some businesses, you need to diversify. Because all of those restaurants he called, they need outreach. They're closing because their employees got COVID because they don't respect the rules. Thank you very much, Mr. Call President. Thank you very, very much. Next speaker, please. The next speaker, Christina Hunter. Ms. Hunter, are you here? When you get to the podium, please uh, state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes, ma'am. Do I have to wear this while I speak? Pardon me? Do I have to wear this while yes, I speak? Yes, ma'am, you do. Okay. First of all, that doesn't make sense. And you can hardly understand anyone in these masks. Uh, my name is Christina Hunter, 1835 Dever Drive. It's also ridiculous to say our addresses over the internet for everyone to know. Um, first of all, none of your masks, for people who follow the FDA, the CDC, and the NIH, none of your masks are FDA approved. None of it makes sense. All of you got your mask from somewhere that's not regulated at all. None of them absolutely do anything. The coronavirus particle is so small that it travels through the air and can go all around your mask. So even if you wear two masks, it doesn't make sense. Um, but you know what? Instead of taking the time to pass measures that don't work against the coronavirus and wasting taxpayers' money, which you live off of, I want to actually talk about something that's really important, which is the gain-of-function research that got us here in the first place. The CDC, the NIH, and the HHS all collaborated with the Wuhan Virology Institute to create the spike protein in the coronavirus that got us here where we are now. Anthony Fauci is responsible for funding this research that got us here. Yet you trust these people for their guidance. I want to point out that in 1999, the HHS funded research amplifying the infectious character of coronaviruses. In 2003, UNC Chapel Hill received an NIH grant on synthetically altering coronaviruses. This was classified at the time. In 2006, Chinese researchers developed SARS-CoV-2. In 2011, scientists expressed concern about gain-of-function research in Wisconsin and the Netherlands after they made the already lethal H1N1 more infectious. Are you getting yet that the CDC is not here to help us and that you're just pawns to do things to be tyrannical against us? Do you get that yet? I'll keep going. In 2014, Obama stops gain-of-function research only to lift the ban in 2017. Uh, it keeps on going. Uh, in 2018, Dr. Zainley presents research at Shanghai University um, that's already been deleted from the university web website about how he re-engineered the spike protein to infect, to permeate human cells. Um, so going off of this, I want to emphasize that the research that you are research that you're going off of and the guidance that you're going off of comes from the same people who manufactured this virus in this pandemic the same people who accidentally unleashed smallpox because they just find 50 vials of it. The same people who accidentally exposed people to anthrax. So you totally trust the government for all of your recommendations. And they're the ones who started this. I want you to think about the source. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Uh, <laughs> next speaker, Mr. County Administrator.
The next speaker, Dustin Wells. All right, Mr. Wells, thank you for coming, sir. Would you uh, please state your name and address for the record when you reach the podium? You have three minutes. All right, I'm Dustin Wells, uh, Pontiac Drive, Tallahassee, Florida. Um, just echo, I'm not going to echo everything that everybody said. Um, I mean, you've heard, you know, from the doctor and from um, a fellow business owner, Drew McLeod, here in, in Tallahassee. But, you know, y'all uh, instituted this mask mandate last year, and you, I, was, I watched you online. You said, we'll get back together in two weeks and revisit it. Um, and you never did. And you crippled local businesses and caused them to go out of business. Um, I mean, people all across Tallahassee and Leon County are struggling. And just like Christina says, I mean, you, you make money uh, or you get paid from our tax dollars. So if we're not making money, then you don't have, you don't have a job. And, um, you know, we're, we're tired of, I mean, I can sit here and watch everybody in here. Every one of you has touched your mask since you've been here. You touched the door when you walked in that every one of us has touched. So if one of us in here has corona, you've all got it now. These masks are ridiculous. I mean, they don't stay up while you're talking. They come down. You got to keep pulling them up. You can breathe right through them. Smoke goes through them. I mean, I, I've done mold, been on jobs with mold and everything. And if I'm wearing one of these, I'm, I'm going to be sick at the end of the day. Okay? So if I can see mold and I can't see a virus, it goes right through this. I mean, this lady over here has got gaps in hers. Yours is, it, Carolyn is the biggest mask I've ever seen. Air's blowing right through the ends of it. Um, and I, I mean, it, it's ridiculous that y'all will institute something that, that's totally unconstitutional. I don't care what he says. We, we, we can make the decisions for ourselves whether or not we want a vaccine or a mask and all of that. And for you to force People across Leon County, employees to take a vaccine, an experimental drug into their body is ridiculous. And you're championing it like, man, we're the first people in America to do that. I can tell you right now, I will take every penny that I can scrape together and every business owner that I know, and we will campaign against you. and We will sit in your seat after the next election. We are sick and tired of, being, of putting up with this crap. There is no excuse. Why, if you want to wear a mask and, and put something into your vein, then do it. I mean, if these masks really work and they do what they're supposed to do, then you should be safe, right? If the vaccine works, then you should be safe. We're not doing it anymore. It doesn't matter what you say you want done. We're not going to comply. And I'll pass with that. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Next speaker, please. The next speaker, Britt Stevens. Mr. Stevens, thank you for being here, sir. Please state your name, name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Yes, sir. Britt Stevens, 7225 in Hing Farm Road. Um, wasn't planning on speaking tonight, and I'm not going to go anywhere as far as what's right or not, as far as uh, science, vaccines, not. There is a virus, there is a worldwide pandemic, there is a problem. People are dying. I've known people to be sick. My parents, God bless them, they almost died and got, got the virus and, and got sick and died. My only reason for being here right this second is, you know, I'm, I'm at a loss for what to tell my child. I am a believer that we are a country of rules and laws, and there's laws in place that whether I like them or not, I'm supposed to follow them. And, and I don't see where our local government has followed the, the due process of the law. As I understand it, there's order in place, whether that's new or 100 years old, laws in place giving me the right as a parent to make a choice whether to send my child to school with a mask or not. Um, that, that, that law, that ruling was appealed. Judge issued a, a written ruling, making it in effect, I believe, last Thursday or so, which was immediately appealed by the governor. I understand that until that's ultimately over, overturned, the law that's in place is the law that was in place. Um, you know, and I had that ability to make a decision about 
whether or not I send my child to school with a mask. I think that there's all sorts of things that we are doing that, that, that help reduce the spread of coronavirus. Me personally, I have challenges with my child that limit his ability to, to learn when he is covered with a mask and his ability to verbally you know, see and hear and comprehend. That is a huge detriment to my child that I've noticed in the past year in, in, in being in that environment. The risk collectively, the way that I view it as the parent, is my risk to my child is, is, is greater. I'm not going to send him to school when he is sick. And of everything that I've learned in gathered over the last 18 months, this protects the collective when I'm sick, you know, and, and that's it. So bottom line is I respect the rule of law. Um, I'm in a tight spot in telling what my child to respect when it comes to the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevens. Mr. Mr. County Administrator, next speaker, please. The next speaker, Elizabeth Davidson. Ms. Davidson, thank you very much for being here. Please uh, state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. My name is Elizabeth Davidson, 4833 Fred George Road. My grandfather liberated two of the camps from World War II. The last thing he said to me was, do not be silent and stand up for other people. Even if you think you can enact this law, do you really think you know about what I or my family needs to do for the sake of our safety? Or in your case, your political viewpoints. You are not our parents, you are not our physicians, and you are certainly not my savior. You do not get to force masks or vaccines. If you think you can issue this mandate, why don't you mandate other health choices for the community? Why don't you mandate sex condoms or diets for all of us or mental health evaluations? A lot of people died over the COVID because they were mentally ill. When you do end up deciding to commit this, can you clearly say what your metric guidelines will be or are you going to exert this power of overreach for an infinite time like your school board has now done? In other words, do it until I say so. I understand you feel the need to do something, but sometimes the better choice is to do nothing and allow us to make the choice. We are not stupid. We are one of you. We are your constituency. We do not want you to micromanage our children, our family, our businesses, our lives, we are smart, I assure you. I will piggyback off of what Mayor Daly said, but with some changes. This morning, I joined my spouse, my doctor, and my God to uphold the constitutional principle of home rule authority. And we made the best decision for my family when it comes to combating COVID-19 without fear of reprisal. So where are we in this community? After the repeated failure of all the attempts to slow the spread, every day an endless barrage of divide until you comply. Do as I say, not as I do. This law is just temporary. It's not forever. Citizens are to be seen, not heard. If I just comply, will you leave my family alone? Or will I speak out and be doxxed at 4833 Fred George Road? You may mask this, do this mask mandate, and it may last another year. But COVID will still exist, and it will always exist. What next? Are you going to force another lockdown? Oh, but wait, you'll still get paid. We won't. We will be left on the unemployment line. And I assure you, just like somebody else said, there will be others that take your place. Thank you, Ms. Davidson. Next speaker, please. The final in-chamber speaker, uh, citizen to be heard on this item, is Bill Bowling. 
Mr. Bolin, thank you for being here, sir. Would you please state your name and address for the record? You have three minutes. My name is Bill Bowling. I live at 1500 Harbor Club Drive. I'm a physical therapist. I have a doctoral level education and have a little skill in reading research. I spent the last year and a half really studying a lot of the aspects of COVID, particularly the mask issue. Um, I have, I, I just found out about the meeting at four o'clock today, went through a stack of studies and articles I have about masks, grabbed a handful, just want to share a few topics. Why masks are a charade. When you look at evidence, there's a pyramid of evidence. The lowest level is what some big shot tells you. My doctor said this. My therapist said that. The next level is animal experiments. The next level is maybe you do a study with one or two people. The next level you do a study with several more. But the first basic level where you can learn anything is a randomized controlled trial, where you have both a research group and a placebo group. One of the most interesting um, randomized controls trials was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last November. Somebody took a group of Marines. They had one group that was quarantined, masked, and had to social distance. Their drill sergeant was in charge. The other group was told, go do what you want. The interesting thing about this study, by having the drill sergeants in charge, there was no cheating in, that, in this study as compared to say you have a diet study and you don't know if somebody who's supposed to be on a limited carb diet is eating a few Twinkies every night. At the end of that study, they had 1.09% of the masked Marines had COVID. 1.07% of the unmasked Marines had COVID. Earlier in the year, they had somebody do a perspective article where they looked at the studies related to wearing masks doing surgery which is what we all believe in. Nobody wants to go to surgery and get cut open and have some guy sitting there cutting on you in case he sneezes. The author concluded that the best use of the mask was as a talisman, as a, as a sign that, okay, we're wearing masks. That means we wash our hands, we clean our equipment, we clean our tables, we wear surgical garb, and you're in good hands. It was a psychological thing. And a lot of what you hear from people supporting the mask mandate, these people have been scared to death for a year and a half. If you turn on CNN or any of the mainstream news, this is what you get. And um, I would like to offer, I'm sure you guys have a clerk, to loan your clerk my articles. And before you make any vote on a mask mandate that you guys make a commitment to read through this stuff, because I guarantee you haven't heard it before. One other quick thought. I think you made a horrible decision by forcing your Leon County employees to get this vaccine. You look at Israel, 60% of the people over 50 years old who've died at Israel in hospitals had double, had double shots, had both shots. This could really come back to bite. Thank you very much, Mr. Bolin. Thank you. Thank very you. Much, sir. Mm -hmm. Mr. County Administrator. Mr. County Administrator, the next uh, speak, uh, speaker via Zoom, please. Yes, moving to our uh, citizens to be heard joining us uh, Zoom. Uh, we've got four in the queue. Uh, the first one is Pamela Chamberlain. Hello, Ms. Chamberlain. If you can hear me, uh, please state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes, ma'am. Ms. Chamberlain? Moving on, Mr. Chairman, we'll come back. I'll come back and call for Chamberlain. I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Well, we can hear you now. You're with us. Okay, my apologies, not super tech savvy. I'm Pamela Chamberlain. I live at 3711 Shamrock Street West, apartment M162 here in Tallahassee. I'm a small business owner here in Leon County. I'm a health and wellness coach and mindfulness trainer. I'm also the author of a book on COVID-19 for the public. I wanna begin by thanking the commissioners, the staff, all the citizens of our community, and I wanna thank my fellow speakers, but I do have a difference of opinion, uh, probably for most of the people who have been speaking. Um, my ancestors helped found this country. 
and the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. In fact, we were pretty much rabble raisers in England also before we came over here. So I believe very strongly that our diversity of opinion, what I heard tonight, what I'm going to share, is the strength and the foundation of democracy. As a health and wellness professional, I know, I've looked at both sides, I know that there is science, there are physicians, there are facts on all sides of this. Uh, now, my position is I chose to be vaccinated, masks, social distance, all of that. I'm going to be speaking in favor of that tonight. But there's also excellent science in other points of view, especially when you look around the world. Uh, I know that ivermectin and hydrochloroquine are proven to be reasonable, effective treatments against COVID-19 from research done in other countries around the world. I know that there are FDA, CDC approved antiviral medications, and I probably share my same concern about the FDA and the CDC and things like that. I make my personal decision. So here's my first ask of the county commissioners. I want my daughter, who's a Leon County school teacher, to stay safe. I want her children to stay safe. And I am asking the county commission to officially and formally in writing stand with and support the Leon County School Board in continuing mandating all safety protocols. Speaking to personal rights, there are options for parents who don't want to mask. Uh, virtual school, homeschool. I homeschooled my youngest daughter quite a few years ago. And then Governor DeSantis has made scholarships to private schools that don't have these requirements available to the public. So I'm asking us to all work together instead of hating each other or calling other people dumb because they have a different point of view. Um, I'm also asking all of us as a community stand with our medical professionals, our hospitals that are overwhelmed, our first responders, and to do everything we can to keep them safe. And I'm asking our businesses, I'm a small business owner myself. Ms. Chamberlain, um, I'm sorry, ma'am, your time is up. Okay, well, thank you very much. I thank you very much, ma'am. Next speaker, please. Next speaker, Sherry Rourke. Ms. Rourke, thank you very much for being here uh, virtually. Would you please state your name and address for the record? You have three minutes. Calling again, Sherry, excuse me, Rowark. Yes, sorry, I thought I was um, actually going to be texting something, but that's fine. Um, my name is Sherry Rourke. I'm at 2017 Chimney Swift Hollow here in Tallahassee. And um, I only noticed maybe one person that um, actually either you actually brought up that we should be promoting or discussing washing your hands, lose the extra weight, uh, exercise, and get your vitamin D levels checked. Those things actually help if you do get COVID, it will help you recover. Masks do not work. There's not one study that I can find that shows that make any difference in the world. Yet there are multiple studies of the harm that they do. Mandating masks would be an unlawful order. And as a U.S. Army veteran, I have taken an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States as well as to disobey any unlawful orders. Mandating masks or vaccines would be an unlawful order, and I will not comply. That's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Roark. Next speaker, Mr. County Administrator. The next speaker, Wendy Young. Ms. Young, thank you very much If you can, uh, for coming. If you can hear me, please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Calling again, Wendy Young.
I'll move on to the next speaker, and I'll come back and check in to see if, if uh, Wendy Young is with us. Uh, Kim Ross. Ms. Ross, thank you very much for joining us. If you can hear me, please state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. Great, thank you. Um, I am, um, so I'm Kim Ross, and uh, if you can give me a 30-second warning before the, um, the three-minute time, yes. that'd be great. Um, my address is 1203 Buckingham Drive. I am disappointed to be before you virtually today for several reasons. First, I'm disappointed that I cannot be there in person, but given the spread of the Delta virus, um, and the web widespread disregard for simple courtesies like social distancing and masking and keeping my appearances in public to a minimum. I'm especially disappointed that we aren't in a better place. I'm fully vaccinated, and if the same amount of people who were vaccinated for polio or for measles, mumps, and rubella were vaccinated against COVID, both coming in over 90%, we would be in a far different place. So I'm disappointed that we even have to have this conversation, and I absolutely and unequivocally blame those who chose not to get vaccinated for political reasons or freedom, and who have been spreading disinformation, including this evening. Medical professionals and scientists Mr. confirm Sims, that please. wearing masks... I'm sorry? Continue, Ms. Ross. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Okay. Um, medical professions, professionals and scientists confirm that wearing masks great, greatly reduce transmission and is much better at keeping the public safe. Um, if you watch Judge Cooper's decision on school mandates and listen to his logic, he actually turned on the head every alleged fact and study that I've seen quoted by anti-maskers. Um, so there are two things that um, I believe the county should do tonight. First, I would like to see the county commission mandate mask in an indoor setting. I think that the court case on school mandates um, might set pre precedents for establishing a mask mandate. He did refer to masking representing a compelling interest narrowly tailored to, to serve a compelling um, public or um, health or safety purpose. Um, I know not everyone's going to obey it. I know it's hard to enforce, but more people will follow it if it's in place, and that alone will help reduce the spread. If you're not willing to do that, though, perhaps spending the money on a monthly basis to incentivize businesses to mandate masks and letting the public know who has agreed to that. Um, second, the county absolutely must do something about these massive garden gatherings that smush people in like packed sardines. We're seeing it at schools, at concerts, at bars, at football games, indoors and outdoors. Everything, um, based on everything I know about the science, we're going to see a large rise in cases as a result. Look, none of us want to see a full shutdown again. I enjoy going to my gym, yes, in my K95, KN95 mask, um, so that I'm keeping myself and my family safe. And I sure would like to go back to karaoke. So if anyone out there is thinking that those of us that want a mask mandate and want some protections put in place, if you're thinking we want to be stuck at home, you are absolutely wrong. We want to be able to go to your restaurants. Ms. Ross, By the way, it isn't the mask. Thank you so much. It was not the mask mandate that shut businesses down. It was the shutdown, which is what we want to prevent. But we also want to prevent people from dying. We really want our leaders, like you all, thank you so much for here, having us tonight, to take, take some precautions so that we don't end up having to shut down. Indeed, we want these protections so we can have more freedoms. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Ross. <laughs> Mr. County Minister, can we try Ms. Young again? Thank you. We'll, we'll try uh, once again, but I understand that we're having some technical difficulties with uh, Mrs. Young, so we're, we'll, we apologize. Uh, mm -hmm. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll hand it back to you. All right. Thank you, Mr. County Administrator. All right, commissioners, um, any comments or discussion? I have uh, Commissioner Maddox first and then Commissioner Jackson. <laughs> the technology doesn't lie. I'm a vet, um, man. It's, 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 I'm, I'm a, I got about, got about eight years on you, bro. Commissioner but, but I will let you go first if you like. All right. Um, I prepared a few remarks for tonight um, <clears throat> in anticipation of being here. I've been exceptionally proud of the work that our county has done as the lead agency uh, during this pandemic. Leon County has been recognized far and wide for this. And we as commissioners have been well advised and I've been, and I believe have taken every action necessary to protect our community along the way. For the first half, for the first year and a half of this pandemic, we received comprehensive, we received comprehensive Every single day, we receive comprehensive updates from the county administrator. Not just once a week, not just once every two weeks, 
Every single day we receive comprehensive updates from the county administrator. And we just recently went to weekly updates instead of every single day. This board has followed the data and the science with every mitigation measure we have put in place. Our staff has been two steps ahead of every government agency in developing emergency programs and, and distributing millions in assistance for people, businesses, and nonprofits. In fact, we are number one, again, number one in Florida in distributing, distributing emergency assistance funds. These are all things that we can actually be proud of we've done during this pandemic. Thanks to our county administrator, and some people agree, some people don't, but he made a decision for his staff that actually he is in charge of making, not us. Uh, we are the first in Florida, in, uh, we, we are the first organization in this entire country to, re to require vaccinations of our employees and the first local government to do so in the country as well. Many have followed suit since then. Uh, I respect every commissioner's desire to request a special meeting, I really do. I received a lot of emails about that and to ask questions, but when I know that those questions have been answered, again, by, again, those questions have been answered, whether it's been through those updates that we've received or emails that we've sent individually or things that have been put out publicly, those questions have been answered. And I see your social media post that we could be and should be doing more to save lives in our community. Excuse me, but that raises some serious questions for me because I think we've done a great job of trying to do what we can do to get through this pandemic. So I just have a couple of questions that I would like to ask. And uh, I ask for short answers if I can receive them. Madam Attorney, you spoke earlier about, I think you called it strict scrutiny uh, for the emergency orders now, correct? Madam County Attorney. That's correct. With that talk, there has been public that our ability to do more with respect to mitigation measures uh, mainly with the mass mandate and strict scrutiny and all that kind of stuff that, that, that you spoke of. Let's say we did impose this mass mandate. Have we met the, have we even met the floor of the legal standard that act, that required, that's required of us to take that action? Have we met that floor as we sit here today? Madam County Attorney. Based on what's presented at this meeting, no, I do not think so. Thank you. Mr. Administrator, have our health care providers our healthcare professionals locally and, and, and partners, have they expressed any requests that we put in place a mass mandate? Mr. County Administrator. I want to make sure, I want to make sure Commissioner Maddox, that I understand your question, right? It, did you say, that, did have our healthcare partners, the hospitals, I believe in this case, have they requested that we put in place a mandate uh, on mass? The answer is no. Hospitals, experts, has anybody that we would consider an expert in this town said required us to put in place a mass mandate? The public health experts that we coordinate with on a daily basis, including the hospitals and the health department, have not requested that we put in place a mandate. Just to make sure that, that, that I'm not just asking a question and people understand it, what, I'm, what I'm saying here, have you consulted with these people to be able to answer the question is no? We've consulted with them, yes. Madam Attorney, can you remind me of the Chairman's authority to call an emergency meeting? I know the poli I know a, I know a policy, I know it's in our policy and under what's in that policy, but what constitutes an emergency? The policy provides that for matters of extreme emergency, a special board meeting may be called by the Chair upon adequate notice being provided under Section 286.0011 Florida Statutes. That would be a determination made by the chairman that this uh, matter constituted an extreme emergency. So the, so the chairman's definition of emergency becomes an emergency. So, so if, if the chairman deems it to be an emergency, then we, we come together. There is no legal definition County, of what an emergency actually is. Madam County Attorney. There is nothing in the board policy that defines what extreme emergency means. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, there are many times, there have been many times that we need to call an emergency meeting uh, to take emergency actions on issues. I respectfully submit that emergency meetings should be reserved specifically for emergencies. And the reason I make that statement is for everything that I just said thus far. No legal standing here. No health provider has asked that we do this. There is absolutely, and our county administrator has consulted, and we've done a lion's share of work over the past 18 months to put us in a position 
to say that we have followed CDC and did everything that we were supposed to do. But we sit here in the emergency meeting entertaining the thought and entertaining the question of a mass mandate when next week, as a matter of fact, we have a meeting that we could have had the same exact conversation. Could we have waited a week? I think that's a question that all you guys could ask yourself. I think we could have waited a week. I think some people are saying the numbers are declining. I just don't think that we need to be sitting here having this conversation today when we have a meeting that we could have had it next week. Finally, commissioners, we need to be very proud of the work of our county and our county administrator. Very proud of the things that we've done, the things that we've put in place, and how we've gone about things. I have always been proud to be a part of this organization, but never as proud as I have been over the past 18 months. Think about when you first took oath to office. Did you know that you'd be dealing with a pandemic? I mean, we dealt with hurricanes, we dealt with a bunch of stuff, but a pandemic. And the way we've handled it, handled it over the past 18 months, I believe should be a model for what other counties should look to do when dealing with a pandemic. We could write a book about it. The kind of administrator, I'd suggest that we do it and put it out for sale, that people buy it. We should not, after everything we have been through, uh, now start to suggest that the public, to the public, that there are, there are things we should and could be doing that neither that is neither legal or recommended by health professionals. Again, after we have followed the science, we have followed the professionals every step of the way, but here we sit here today recommending that or thinking about doing something that has neither been recommended by healthcare professionals nor is nor do we have a legal standing to do. Why are we having this conversation today? Again, well, we could be having this conversation a week from now. Our community needs to know about the work of our organization over the past 18 months. The, link, the links we have gone to keep them safe, to provide for testing, to promote vaccines, to get them the money they need to pay their bills, and yes, to do everything we can do to try to get back to some semblance of normalcy. The last thing we need to do during a crisis is to confuse and add to the noise around the issue. That is disappointing. There's enough of that. Let's get back to work. We have done, again, a great job up to this point. We're sitting here today entertaining a question that, quite frankly, legally we can't do and no one is asking for. Let's get back to work. Let's keep doing what we're doing. Let's trust in the process that we put in place. And then if we start seeing the recommendations come down from public health officials, and if we ever get to a place of legal standing, then we have the conversation. But not a second before that point when we've done so many great things. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the time, and I'm sorry for, I'm sorry for the length. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Maddox. Next, I have um, Commissioner Jackson, then Commissioner Cummings, and then Commissioner Kozier. Commissioner Jackson. Yeah. Um, thank you for your remarks, uh, Commissioner Maddox. Uh, I hate to be um, redundant, uh, but I have, since the meeting was called, I've spent quite a bit of time putting together a, a few remarks that I thought were germane. And you totally stole my thunder by <laughs> making some of the same points. So I won't be redundant. I will tell you that the one thing I'm uh, very uh, happy to see is uh, all of the presenters that were here tonight and the uh, incredible work that's going on at the county level. Um, the partners in the medical community are, are really the front line on this issue. And we will um, eternally be in their debt for their work. Um, during this time of a uh, crisis, can't thank our uh, medical community enough. Um, and Leon County has served alongside them. Uh, I think that um, Chief Chad said that we had more transports than ever before for a single month for August. Is that correct? Did I hear that right? Yeah. Um, those folks come at a moment's call, and they go into homes with uncertain situations and run a real risk by going into those homes to uh, readily transport folks to uh, get the medical attention they deserve. Uh, Ms. Blackburn, you and your staff are, um, again, remarkable resources. Shankton, you and your staff, I'm sure I'm missing someone that I shouldn't, but um, it is great to get this kind of information. Uh, you know, as commissioners, uh, we've done all this kind of deliberately through the whole phase. Uh, and I think that, that gives us a certain level of credibility. And I think that credibility is going to be so important as we move through this next phase. I like to think of things in phases or 
or, or time periods. I think that that credibility um, is going to be needed as we move to it. You know, personally, um, as someone who lost people close to me early on in the pandemic and um, also contracted the virus personally before a vaccine was available, and I have struggled now for 430 days uh, as a recovering long hauler. And um, that's not fun. I've never had to be convinced about the seriousness of what's going on and our obligations to act. And I have endorsed many of those obligations to act because at that time our community needed it. We were sitting in wait for vaccines. And on this, I take a back seat to no one, but I'll, I, I think that all of us here on the board, everyone here present and not present, I think all of us care about this. And I don't think any one of us commissioners cares more than another uh, on this particular issue as it relates to public health. But I encourage us as decision makers to, um, to fight the urge to let no good crisis go to waste. Uh, Winston Churchill said that at... Um, one of his um, speeches. I'm not sure where the discussion will go tonight, but I do want to make clear my stance as a commissioner. Um, and I'm going to try to do that briefly because we only give you guys three minutes. I'm not interested in uh, empty gestures or performance art. And that's not who we've been on this issue in the entire time. We have been leaders. And we've made decisions based on uh, data and science and medical experts, people that do this every single day. We've been aggressive when necessary, and we've been narrowly focused to address the most critical issues so that we can maintain uh, our maximum efforts to combat the virus, uh, either through the vaccine or safe measures for those that can't receive the vaccine. It was mentioned several times about children at schools are masked because they're not eligible for school vaccines, and that's the reason why the effort came for K through 8. I, like uh, Commissioner Maddox and all of the rest of you, want to see our community return to some normalcy. And I'd like to, I'd like to thank my colleagues, maybe in advance, to try to avoid the appearance of scoring political points or creating a political optic to a crisis. Um, I think that's very important that we stand strong because that credibility is more important than ever. It will probably be our most important tool as we continue to move forward against a virus that really doesn't have an expiration date or a time that it's going to just go away. I want to thank the staff again. Can't thank them enough. Uh, our community partners, our medical partners, and our medical experts for the update tonight, as well as legal counsel and the county administrator. Matt, I did leave you out. Great job. And I'll, um, I'll part with uh, these remarks, uh, vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Jackson. I've got Commissioner Cummings, Commissioner Dozier, and then Commissioner Welch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, just get clarification from our county attorney, Mr. Chairman, if that's possible. Sure. sure. Okay. I believe she indicated that if a mass mandate is instituted by this body, that it would only extend for seven days without the body having to renew it. Can, would you explain that or expound on that a little more? I'm County Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Commissioner Cummings, the legislature, when it amended 252.38, uh, instituted new procedural requirements any time a local emergency order is adopted. And now, unlike when in the past and even going forward, when it doesn't qualify as a local emergency order, what can historically has happened and what can still in some other cases continue to happen is uh, the chairman, the vice chairman, or in the absence of those two, the county administrator has the authority to issue what we've historically called a local proclamation, okay? 
Those have historically been renewed every seven days, but it did not require that the board meet and that the board uh, renew it by majority vote. So that is a new procedural requirement for local emergency orders based on the change in the statute. Oh, thank you, um, Ms. County Attorney, and thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. But I'd like to just e expound a little. Sure, I, go I, ahead, ma'am. I think we are all here for the same reason. We are concerned about the health, safety, and welfare of our families, of our citizens, and each, each one of us. So I want to thank um, a county administrator and those individuals that have taken the time to come before us tonight and give us some specific information about what the county has been doing to combat this pandemic. And also, um, Ms. Blackburn and her, her staff for giving us information so that we recognize that the county has been actively uh, involved in trying to curtail and, and do whatever mitigation efforts we can to stop the flow of this virus. I, for one, am totally in favor of masks. Um, there's some recommendations from the CDC that says masks does slow the spread of the virus. And of course, you can always get differing opinions. However, I am concerned also about this body taking action that's legal and lawful. And I think citizens of Leon County, we follow the law. Whatever the law is, we, we are not deliberate uh, lawbreakers. If I felt as a county commission that we could institute an emergency situation right now and mandate that everybody wear a mask, I would be in favor of it. I'm concerned about enforcement. I'm concerned about instituting such an ordinance that expires in seven days that would have to be reinstituted, but is also subject to a legal challenge. I respect the advice of our county attorney, Attorney Osteen, and she has said on the day of tonight that, in her opinion, we don't meet the legal threshold to institute the mass ordinance. So I believe if we took steps uh, to do that in the face of the legal advice from our county attorney, I'm not sure if that would be misfeasance, malfeasance, uh, but we would be taking steps that's contrary to what we're being advised now. I believe that everybody in here recognizes that we are all in this together. None of us want to be ill. None of us want our family members to be ill. I'm definitely clearly concerned about our children and our schools, our teachers, janitorial workers, bus drivers. We are all concerned about the health, safety, and welfare, but we have to address it legally. Now, I understand, and I was not on this board last year, but this particular statute that restricts what we do was not on the books last year. I'm, I'm correct. And so I believe this commission had a lot more latitude on implementing mass mandate. But I, for one, I'm, I'm not interested in an exercise of fertility. And that's essentially based on the advice of our council. That's essentially what it would be, an exercise in futility. So I want to, Mr. Chairman, just 
stand on the record as saying, I am in favor of mass. However, I'm not in favor of this body taking an action that's contrary to the statute and that would be would constitute illegality and unlawful activity. I respect the advice of counsel and I respect all of you for coming, giving your opinion. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, we all want to live, we want to save lives, we want to slow down the spread of this virus. And I believe right now, Mr. Chairman, unless something else happens, and let's pray that it doesn't, but I think right now what we as a body can do is to strongly urge the citizens to take mitigation action to uh, slow this virus and not mandate the mass when we really don't have legal basis or authority to do so at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Cummings. We've got Commissioner Dozier and then Commissioner Welch and then uh, Commissioner Maddox again. Commissioner Dozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, I'm really kind of amazed. I'm not sure who told any of you that I was going to ask for a mask mandate tonight. Seriously. I, I am really quite astonished. Commissioner Maddox, if you did read my Facebook post, or which echoed the letter I sent to the chairman, it absolutely did not include a discussion of a mask mandate tonight. That does not mean that a mandate might not be required at some point, nor that it couldn't be done legally. In fact, uh, Madam County Attorney, it's my understanding that today the Alachua County Commission reaffirmed their mandate for the fourth week in a row, and it has not been invalidated by the governor. Is that correct? Madam County Attorney. Uh, that is correct. I can't speak to the specifics, but that is factually accurate. I got a text from the chairman of the Alaska County Commission just when they were about to reaffirm it for the fourth time. Now, there is a reason why our situation is very different than Alachua County. And quite frankly, I spent hours with the county attorney and the county administrator in the last month discussing this because it is such a delicate issue. I absolutely agree, Commissioner Cummings, we should not do anything that was illegal or an exercise in futility. But I do absolutely believe that there was a need to get together before our regular meetings this fall. The seven of us, six for tonight, are not legally allowed to discuss any issues that may be voted on at this commission outside of a meeting. This is the only chance we have to hear from each other, to talk about these issues. And I think we can say probably unanimously that our Leon County staff for the last 18 months has been exemplary. You heard an update earlier from evictions and getting the money out the door, top in the state, top 10 in the country, to all of the types of ways that we've supported our community and continue to, it is phenomenal. Chief Abrams, I think you're still here from our first responders, um, our emergency management, all of our people have been working tirelessly for the last 18 months. So, I, again, I'm pretty surprised. I was very deliberate in the list of issues that I put out, and quite bluntly, I did it on that Friday because I was amazed that I was the only one asking about this. I thought for sure, based on the comments I was hearing from our community, the questions, and let me say, the few low-hanging things that this commission could act on. Count, we, we delegate a whole lot of authority to our county administrator, rightly so, but not everything. But there is a reason for this board. We are elected. 
And during a pandemic, for us to have not met in eight weeks and going into a very busy fall, having this conversation now, setting the terms, hearing from our community for how we were going to approach this, I thought it was important. We didn't have to be here. I'm not chairman. But I thought it was important. And Mr. Chair, thank you for calling the meeting. I truly appreciate it. So for my part here, I really, I got to say that the, the question of to mask or not to mask has skewed everything. We're seeing a phenomenal football game this weekend marred by, I'm just looking at the crowds and wondering about a surge in our hospitals and thinking about the nurses who's contacted me. I am so glad we're on the field. And they did a darn good job. Excuse me, I was about to say something else. Um, really celebrate that. We have to stay open. We do not want to shut down. But there are mitigation measures that we can take. So on the masks, for example, why don't we lead by example? We have businesses out there who are putting up signs recommending or requiring masks. They're asking their employees to require or to wear masks. I would very much like to see our county facilities beyond the courthouse, and particularly the libraries where we have kids and families and seniors and everyone else, vulnerable populations, to have a mask mandate. That is something the county administrator could only do with our direction. So that's the first thing. I'll come back to that in a minute. Beyond that, I think we have to get creative. Our vaccination rates are at 57%. That is well done by our Lanarin County Health Department, by the task force, by our staff. Phenomenal effort. Are there other ways that we could boost those numbers? Mr. Chair, I have talked to a member of our school board who would very much like to work on this. Well, our task force is going to refocus on, or going to focus in next phase on youth and millennials. She asked if perhaps there could be a mayor, chair, superintendent, school board meeting with the task force to discuss this. I thought it was a great idea. That would be at your discretion, um, and you may get a call about that. But we need all hands on deck, as we have since the beginning. Again, that's something we can only talk about here in the room. And Commissioner Jackson, Commissioner Welch, you're in the trenches in the schools day to day. What if we could have your back a little bit more? Help with some of this vaccine hesitancy. Help with some of the education that some of the speakers have talked to. This is our space to get creative. And you know what? We have limited time to talk during most commission meetings. A special, not an emergency meeting, Commissioner Maddox, I specifically said special for a reason. It, feels like an emergency, but it, I knew there was a difference there. So those are two things. I think we should get more creative on vaccine hesitancy and work with our incredible task force that has done so much to help build some connections and mandate masks in our facilities. Beyond that, the questions about events. Yes, as Matt, you, you cited, every grant recipient had to turn in a COVID plan with Visit Tallahassee and with COCA. Some of them are asking for direction. They need to tell their patrons, are masks required or not? They're willing to do it. They want to do it. Maybe not all of them, but many of them. So if we want to mitigate this at events, I wonder if it's legal within our scope for a grant recipient who already has um, a COVID plan to be required to have masks. One of the questions I wanted to ask tonight was to ask our county attorney to look into that and bring us back information. Again, another good reason to meet today so we are prepared on the 14th to take more steps. Mr. Chair, well, other people were preparing remarks to... Uh, talk about why we don't need to be here, with due respect, gentlemen. I have a tremendous list of questions um, and things that I think we may be able to help with. 
I'm going to save this for when we get more pre presentations in the future. Those are the top two right there, or top three, forgive me. Events, facilities, masks, and looking at the task force and helping them connect with the schools. The last thing I'm going to say, and I truly, truly hope that we can dig into this more in the future. Um, Commissioner Maddox, in your line of questions, you asked county attorney if we met the floor for a mask mandate. And Madam County Attorney, you said not in what was presented at today's meeting, correct? We didn't have any of that data presented at today's meeting. We didn't ask for it. Is that correct? Madam County Attorney. <coughs> the statement stands based on what was presented. It was not sufficient. Thank you. If ever we were to move in that direction, it would require rigorous testimony and a lot of numbers. And thankfully, our numbers are coming down right now. And we probably don't meet the criteria for a mandate, which is exactly why I didn't ask for one. Secondly, hospitals have not requested the mandate. They have not. I've talked to both of our hospital administrators. However, they strongly encourage masks, and they are fully aware of the legislation. <coughs> Just because we have been restricted by a state government that has put onerous laws on counties to protect public health, that refuses since June 2nd to share county data on deaths and other specifics that they shared before, we should not avoid this conversation. And with that, I think we do need to do everything we can to get our own local data. There are six county health departments in the state working with locals that self-report this data. Based on an article today in the paper, our numbers, up until a few weeks ago, the media was reporting 332 deaths in Leon County. It's the same number we had in our update on June 4. Based on the numbers, the Tallahassee Democrat out of the Gainesville Sun, we have lost 390 people since June. We have lost more people since June than we lost in all of the months prior to that. This is an emergency to me. And if our board is not going to sit here and get creative and do our part, I am astonished. Mr. Chair, I'm, without coming back, I'm going to let the discussion go, but I will just go ahead and make a, a motion to require masks in county facilities to bring back information at the next meeting about grant recipients and whether or not they could be required to have masks for certain events. And I will not make this part of a motion. It is your discretion to have a mayor chair meeting with the schools and the task force, but that would be great. So my motion is for more information about the grants and for requiring masks in county facilities. Thank you, Commissioner Dozier. Mm -hmm. I will second that motion. Thank you. Uh, in discussion in the, in the in the speaker's queue, I've got Commissioner Welch and then Commissioner Maddox. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I I want to not reiterate everything that's been said, um, but I do want to thank our staff, uh, Mr. County Administrator. Uh, all of the folks who presented tonight, Shington and Chief Abrams and Allen, uh, Mr. Deputy County Administrator, Madam County Attorney, I have the full faith in y'all's decision making. Uh, I know that you have your finger on the pulse of what is going on. I, I think the meeting is appropriate. Um, I think it, it, it is a good opportunity for us to get together. I share some of the frustration about how we got here, how this manifested. Um, I think the timing may be a little off considering we're meeting in a week. Um, so I do share that frustration. Uh, I think all of us are in regular communication with the county administrator. Uh, he keeps us apprised of the sort of local state of affairs in terms of the, the pandemic. 
I think that if we can accept that our staff is really on top of it, um, then, you know, we probably could have waited another week to figure out this information. Um, I think when it comes to mitigation measures, I, I think there are, are a lot of challenges that we face with mask mitigation. Uh, I think we've discussed the legal problems that we may have. I think there are practical problems, and I think there are uh, logistical problems. But we can flesh that out later at our meeting in a week. For me, the barometer for how we react or how we make policy as local leaders is I'm going to listen to the hospitals. If the hospitals come in here and say we're about to be overrun, we need your help, we need something, then we have something to consider. But as the status quo sits, my understanding is that we're on the backside of this current surge. We don't know necessarily what's going to be coming in December when the weather gets cooler. So I appreciate the opportunity to hear from folks, even though it more or less reiterates what we have all been informed about in the past week or so. Um, so I would, I think all of us sort of realize at this point that vaccinations are the key to moving on from this situation. It is our number one tool according to every public health professional at this point. And so not even getting into the problems with masks that I, that, you know, the logistical uh, problems, the legal problems and the practical problems. I really would like to see a real robust, a more robust programming towards encouraging vaccines. Um, again, I have faith in the county administrators judgment about masks in public buildings, in our building. Uh, I do think that it is our job as public facing leaders to strongly encourage folks to wear masks where they can't social distance. I think it is our job as public facing leaders to strongly, strongly encourage folks to get vaccinated if it is the right thing for them and what their doctor recommends. I, I see our role as encouragers to folks. I think, and Commissioner Jackson will probably uh, understand this, as educators we deal with behavior all the time. And we're talking about human behavior. And as an educator, the, the first thing you learn is classroom management, right? You gotta, under, you gotta be able to control your classroom. You gotta be able to moderate and deal with behavior before any messaging can come across. So no, no teaching can happen until you can control behavior. And we're talking about behavior. And, and a lot of teachers subscribe to the notion that you gotta start out real hard and strict and firm on your behavior and then you can lighten up. And I don't embrace that. <laughs> I've never embraced that. I think you start out friendly and you start out encouraging and you start out um, on the lighter side of things. You can always tighten up if you need to. So um, I share, again, some of the frustration with us being a week away from our regularly scheduled meeting. But I do think all in all it is appropriate. I think the, uh, I trust the chairman's um, discretion in calling a meeting. I appreciate hearing from our staff. We haven't been together in a long time. Uh, but I, uh, I am nowhere near being ready to install a mask mandate in, in our public indoor public areas right now. I just think that there are far too many concerns with that. And again, the situation may change. If the hospitals come in here and say they're about to be overrun, they're going to be closed down, we got to do something, that changes our situation and that changes our reaction. So um, I look forward to us revisiting these conversations. Uh, I don't know if I need to make a motion for the county administrator, but I would assume that we're going to get more regular updates now, probably at every meeting from Claudia like we were getting before, or is that something I would need to make a motion? I think we do need to get more updates, get back on a more frequent update routine. Um, Mr. County Administrator, would you please uh, respond to that? I was just going to say, working with the chairman, we were planning on just having that as a standing uh, yeah. update on all of your agendas again. I think that would be a step in the right direction. Um, I think we can get into the, 
the minutia of potential policy solutions at, at another time. Uh, I'm comfortable where we're at uh, right now in terms of the decision-making process, and uh, I'll look forward to further and more robust discussions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Welch. We've got uh, Commissioner Maddox and then Commissioner Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> the seriousness of what this pandemic re represents is that very serious. But as we sit up here today, the comment was made that this was a special meeting, which, Madam Attorney, does the chairman have the ability to call a special meeting? Is that in policy anywhere? Madam County Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The board policy uses the phrase... For matters of extreme emergency, a special board meeting may be called by the chair. Okay. So emergency and special is about the same thing. So this is an emergency meeting in that sense. My point is this. If we were going to be here sitting here discussing something today, it should have been a major decision of whether to mass mandate or not. I think that what we could have done here or what, what, what could have happened is in some kind of way request the information so we can have a more robust conversation at our board meeting next week when we talk about whether or not we really want to seriously look at a mass mandate. we got a lot of questions answered here. But when we come away from this table, what we will have in place if this motion passes is a requirement that people wear masks in county facilities. I believe that we could have done that next week. How many facilities uh, besides the one, uh, well, Mr. Administrator, how many facilities in town would that actually affect? Mr. County Administrator. I know the square footage won't mean anything to, but it's uh, close to a close to a million uh, square feet. But it's uh, uh, again, as we've said, I'll uh, take I'll take close to a million square feet. Yes. Well, well, when you talk, when you when you sit down and you call these kind of meetings, people fully expect to walk away. But you're making a huge difference in what people are going to do to mitigate and 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 do something about the pandemic. And when, we, when we're going to have those conversations, I fully expect for us to, to have that kind of conversation, not to simply just ask questions and, and come away with a, with a requirement for our facilities. Mr. Chairman, if, if, if the numbers have doubled since June, then there was some point within June and August that we should have had this conversation if we were going to have a special meeting. It didn't have to be a week before our meeting that we have coming up. I think MASK do do something. I do. I believe I wear a mask. I am fully vaccinated. I believe it does help. For every person who has lost a family member, this is serious. This is serious. This is an emergency. For everyone who's, who's, who has someone who's on a ventilator, for everyone who has someone who's sick, for everyone who has some, have watched someone come, in, come off of COVID and still have issues afterwards, this is a very serious thing. And you should expect when we sit up here that we're going to make a decision that is that's legal that's going to affect that very serious thing that you're that we're all dealing with not just merely ask some questions because when you do that i believe people and, and, and the assumption is I don't, I don't think anybody thought we would come up here and just just ask questions I think everybody pretty much assumed that if we were having this conversation if we were having this meeting that we were going to talk about a mass mandate that's been the thing that people have talked about. That's been the thing that the school board has moved in, in, in favor of. If we're going to have a conversation, it's going to be about exactly that. I came prepared to have the conversation. I came prepared to take a vote. I came prepared to listen to what everyone had to say. And if we were going to do it today or if we we're going to do it next week, I came prepared to do so. I just would have said to us all, let's get the information. Everything that you said, Commissioner Doge, you asked our county attorney, if the, if the information presented, like you said, did not get, give us legal standing, and she said the same thing, the information presented. Well, if there's more information that we can receive that would give us that legal standing, then let's ask the county administrator for that information so the next time that we have a meeting, we can actually have a conversation about getting in the way of having some legal standing to actually implement a mass mandate. I just... People's lives are at stake. People are passionate about this thing. And I just want us to be able to have conversation with all the information and be able to move in one way or the other 
to make a difference in how we're dealing with this pandemic. I think vaccinations are something that we have worked hard on. I think, we, as, as I think Commissioner uh, Cummings said, we can strongly encourage. But the fact of the matter is, we don't have the legal standing for a mass mandate. As many questions we want to ask, we don't have the legal standing. And I do believe that maybe our county facilities having uh, having that uh, the uh, mandate in county facilities may make a, a little difference. But when it comes to to the to 300 and some thousand people that we affect, how many of them are in or out of, of county facilities every single day? I just want us to have a real robust, serious conversation with all of the information so we can make big decisions on how we're going to deal with a major pandemic. Mr. Chair, I respect your ability, again, to call a special meeting. And like I said before, I do believe this is special. I do believe that it's an emergency for those who have lost people. But if we're going to do this, I just want to make decisions that are based off of emergency that meets the decision, met the, the, the level of the emergency that we're dealing with. And I just don't think that us asking questions and just simply asking for our county facilities to have masks in them is something that we couldn't have, that we could, that, we, that needed to happen now that we couldn't do next week. And like I said, if this is a month ago and we were having this conversation, special meeting, okay, let's do it. But we're talking about a week before our next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Maddox. Let me go ahead and, and jump in here because most people have spoken for a couple of different times already. Um, a couple of people have, have called into question the need for this meeting tonight, as if it, as if the situation wasn't important enough. Um, you know, I, I received a request to hold a meeting, an emergency meeting, um, last week, and initially I, I gave well, I gave this request a lot of thought, and at first. I thought perhaps this, a meeting like this, an emergency meeting, wasn't necessary for the reasons that Commissioner Maddox and Commissioner Jackson and others have said. Um, our county staff and our community partners have done an incredible job, an incredible job fighting this virus. And if you don't believe me, take a look at the 12-page report that was sent to, um, to, in response to Commissioner Dozier's questions. That, that, those 12 pages there go into explicit detail on what the county staff are doing, on what TMH, CRMC are doing, our health, re our health centers, uh, the efforts by Dr. Lane Bryant and R.B. Holmes uh, to, to reach out and help encourage vaccinations. There's an incredible amount of partners all throughout the county that are working very, very hard, have been for 19 months, to fight this virus. And so looking at that information, I... I uh, initially, I, I kind of agreed with Commissioner Jackson and Commissioner Maddox. You know, do we need to have a meeting? But the more that I spoke with some of these partners of ours, the hospitals, the health centers, the more I started reading some of the information that was coming in the, in the Tallahassee Democrat, uh, in our email inboxes, the more I realized, in my opinion, an emergency meeting was necessary. Now, as the county attorney stated, there's not a specific measurable criteria for whether or not a chairman has the ability to call an emergency meeting. It's kind of up to his or her discretion. Well, let me tell you, the vaccination rate in Leon County is 58%. That reflects an incredible amount of effort from a lot of people in this county to increase vaccinations. But still, we are lagging with the statewide vaccination rate of 69%. We need to do better. We've got a great team of people working very hard, but we need to do better. When I spoke with hospitals, they told me about record hospitalizations record numbers of COVID cases. Um, to me, that seems like an emergency. When they tell me about them exceeding ICU bed capacity, to me, that seems like an emergency. When you read in the statement from TMH today that in July they had seven COVID-related deaths, in August they had 73 related COVID deaths, two of them are children, to me, that seems like an emergency. So I f I'm going to sleep well at night by calling this emergency meeting. Because the conditions out there are dire. Yes, we've got our county, we've got our hospitals, our health centers working like crazy to encourage vaccinations. Get a shot, please. We're working with people to, to, to plead with folks to wear a mask. It reduces the spread. And yes, there's evidence to demonstrate that conclusively. So 
The fact that people here on this, on this dais may not think the meeting is necessary, it doesn't mean that they don't care about, about the people here. It just that means that we have a disagreement. There's not a specific criteria for a chairman to call an emergency meeting, but I'm going to err on the side of doing everything I can to protect lives. And so I'm happy I called this meeting because we have not had a meeting since July 27th. We have not had one update here on the dais to talk about the COVID efforts that our county staff have doing a great job on. So I'm very confident in my, my decision to call an emergency meeting. And just because you may disagree with me doesn't mean you care less. I know I, I can speak. I know these people on the diet, dais. Every single one of them cares deeply about this virus and, and protecting the lives and the health of the people who live here. I know that. And so let's not try to play this game about who cares the most, because everyone here cares. Everyone does. Everyone is trying to do the absolute best they can to save the health and lives of the people who live here. So I'm happy I called the meeting. I'm confident I did it. I'm going to sleep well tonight. Thank you very much. Next I have, next I have uh, Commissioner Maddox, then Commissioner, oh no, you spoke already, sir. Uh, Commissioner Jackson, Commissioner Dozier, and then Commissioner Cummings. Yeah, I try to never speak twice on any subject. So uh, did we have, I, I didn't, in the presentations, did we have someone from TMH or CR uh, MC here tonight? Mr. County Administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we do not. They submitted written comments. Okay. And uh, I will remind again, I think we're on update number 317, so it's not as if, you know, I want to make sure um, that everyone understands that at 317, those are very frequently uh, sent to us as far as updates on what's going on. Um, I'm more than happy to meet, but I, I, I will stress again that I'm not interested in political gesturing or performance arts. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Jackson, Commissioner Dozier, and then Commissioner Cummings and Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I have to say, truly, thank you for your comments. My request put you in an uncomfortable position. I understand that. And I believe, Mr. Chair, I know and I'm confident based on our working together that you study these issues as thoroughly as I do. And if there was any other way to share my feelings with you about the need to meet, I would have done it. But there wasn't another legal way. You and I have respected sunshine rules to the nth degree. And this was the only way we could communicate. I thought about it over the weekend and kind of wanted to say, like every good sitcom or dramedy, we got to air our dirty laundry in public, on TV. We got no choice. We have to do this in public. So it was not my choice, Mr. Chair, to put you in that position. And I also want to say that there were some constituents who were really surprised that you and I would disagree in that first weekend. Because... They don't expect a public conflict like this. They have been thrilled that we are moving forward together, and you just summed up your deliberation on this, and it meets the same issues that I was looking at. So thank you. Our disagreements on this board, I hope, and for my part, are not personal. They can be made personal by some people, for sure. And that's kind of really why I chimed in again. I get a lot of grief over the years for asking a lot of questions. I do. We each have our own way of doing this job. But when I got that excellent 12-page report, Mr. Chair, that you talked about, I got pages of notes and questions I could ask, and I stripped out a whole bunch of them. We're talking about just being here, some people think, for political points or, you know, people expecting us to do more than just masks and facilities. Well, if we prevented one family from getting COVID walking into a library, I think that's a good job. It's a good effort on our part. Leon County cannot solve the pandemic. It's bigger than all of us. And we have not addressed 
the incredible politicalization of this. The reason why we're also, I mean, there has been misinformation, there has been lack of data. People are right to question. We, we don't even know how many people have died in our community from the state records in the last few months. This is coming from other sources. This is incredibly challenging. I respect the staff's role in delegating to them. But I will not set aside my duty to this community when I see something that's important, something we could do to help and support from making that known. That is my responsibility. It goes beyond encouragement and it goes to action. But it also goes to question and working with good colleagues to come up with solutions. So I hope we can dispense with this strife at this meeting and move forward because there's a lot more we can do on this subject and others. Mr. Chair, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Dozier. I've got Commissioner Cummings and then Commissioner Welch. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> just very briefly, I just wanted to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this meeting. I think it, it gave us a great opportunity to listen to staff, get some definitive statistics on our numbers, and I think it allows the citizens to know that we as elected officials represent you. We as elected officials are concerned about the death rates. We are concerned about the fact that we have individuals in the community that are resistant to the vaccine. We are concerned that perhaps maybe masks will slow down <clears throat> the spread of COVID-19, but there are individuals that are resistant uh, to the mask. So I think with all of the, the deaths that have been reported the last 30, 60 days, I am encouraged because a report issued from Capital Regional Medical Center indicated that there's a 29% decrease. And I think that's good news. So I believe that we are hopefully on a, a downturn. We're leveling off as, as far as the percentages are concerned. And I think it's important that the citizens and those individuals here know that the county is on top of the numbers, that the, the county is on top of whether or not there's a surge or whether there's a, a decrease. And I think you need to know that your elected officials are not only concerned, but we are informed about what's going on in the community. If, if there should come a time at, at some point where we need to get back together, uh, Mr. Chairman, I for one, I'm willing to be here. And because I think health, safety, and welfare is paramount for all of our Leon County residents. Um, death is nothing to play with. And all of us have experienced it in our families with our friends right now. So as a public servant, I appreciate being here. And I appreciate the opportunity to have been among the citizens tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cummings. And then Commissioner Wells to wrap it up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. I, I wanted to speak to Commissioner um, Dozier's motion about uh, masks in county facilities. I can't support that tonight. Uh, I would appreciate and I expect that we would have a more robust conversation about that next week uh, as a part of our regular meeting on the 14th. There are questions that go along with that, I think, that need to be answered. Uh, primarily, uh, who's going to enforce that? Are we going to put that on our librarians to go around and adjudicate uh, who's wearing masks in the libraries? I think that's problematic. So um, I just wanted to say that. I'm not against the idea. Uh, it may be, in fact, that the county administrator thinks that's a, a good suggestion. Um, and I don't always agree with the county administrator's suggestions. But I do want to give the county administrator and his staff the opportunity to assess the, the impacts of that move. And I don't feel like this is the appropriate time to do that. So I, I can't support that motion. I just want to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Welch. Uh, Commissioner Cummings, you're in the you you're not in the queue again, are you, Ram? Okay. Okay. I've got Commissioner Maddox next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do think it's worth having a conversation, even in, even if we're not going. 
Well, I'm accessed to a motion that um, we ask the county administrator to bring back an agenda item looking at uh, requiring masks in county facilities and to answer whatever questions Commissioner Dozier had as a part of her motion. That will be my substitute motion, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, Commissioner Maddox, could you clarify that? What about the second part of her original motion? Commissioner Dozier had asked specifics for, for specific things to come back. All I'm doing really is changing her request for a requirement to an agenda item to come back to us at our next meeting to address that. Everything else in her motion basically stays the same. It's hard to hear you, sir. Can you repeat that last sentence? I'm basically asking that the county administrator bring back an agenda item for requirements in uh, for masks in county facilities, and but everything else in Commissioner Dozier's motion that she requested stay the same. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, um, and then the substitute motion was seconded by Commissioner Jackson. Is that correct? Sir, did you second the motion? I second. Yes, oh, Commissioner Welch, um, same hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Any discussion on the substitute motion, Commissioner Dozier? Mr. Chair. Um, in the report you mentioned, county administrator went through um, the status of masks in facilities, the incredible steps he has taken to require masks are, of our employees, and uh, the chief judge order, two orders, in fact, for this facility. Um, forgive me, sir, I haven't given you a chance to speak to this. I just took that from the report, and it did say the commission may want to give direction to require masks in facilities. So, Mr. Chair, since this is the question about whether or not we need an agenda item, Mr. County Administrator, would that agenda item, what would we unpack that we didn't already reflect on in that report? Mr. First, County Administrator. And second, to Commissioner Welch's question, we don't put our employees in a position of conflict with folks. This is a requirement on the door, um, but w I, I, I believe we've talked about this before, that you try to take steps to protect our employees if someone just absolutely refuses to wear a mask. Is that, are those, is that correct? And yeah, it, it, the agenda item would be pretty light. <laughs> It'd be straightforward. It would reflect what we're currently doing, as we've told you, which um, and we've advised you, uh, which is to follow the CDC's guidance in terms of, of recommending that people wear masks in our building. We also have masks there, of which our employees readily uh, make available to people, both cloth and, and, and the uh, surgical masks, uh, available in all of our facilities. Um, so, the, so the issue really is the, an issue of, of policy, since it is a public-facing type of thing, as if the board wanted to. Um, require that. Um, again, from a staff standpoint, um, the enforcement issues and that sort of thing, um, sure, we, we, we have issues, we have conflicts that occur, but again, if we believe them, those to be marginal. And so we could, we could address those. Again, it's really a policy issue of the board if that's something that the board wanted to impose. Thank you. Our phenomenal staff, manage their way through this, as so many businesses did for a while last year. I have confidence in them, and we have the report. I don't believe there's anything more that we could know at this point that wasn't included in that report of August 30. So um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to get the county administrator on the record with those two points. Thank you, Commissioner Dozier. We've got uh, Commissioner Maddox in the queue again. Is that correct? Yeah, just real quick. I mean, we, I don't, we don't have to have a I, I can support it tonight. I just, I don't want to put a commissioner in a position where he's making the decision when, when he's asked for extra information. I don't, I don't think it really warrants anything or hurts anybody if we wait a week and ask for an agenda item to come back. Uh, we've done it on plenty of occasions. Uh, and so I was giving Commissioner Welch an opportunity to have the information he needs to make a decision now. Uh, so, Commissioner Welch, if you feel like you have everything you need, I'll rescind my, my motion. But if, if, if not, then I think if, I think we can we can talk about this and implement it in the agenda item next week. Commissioner Maddox, if, if you if you wouldn't mind, let me go ahead and ask the county administrator real quickly. Uh, Mr. County Administrator, would we be able to I know it's a really short turnaround and, and frankly I think your staff have already completed the agenda for for the 14th, but would you be able to present an agenda item on the 14th related to this issue? We would, and, and and again, and the county attorney and I were just having a sidebar related to 
And we would present those issues to you related to shared spaces and leased spaces and other things like that, that that we could get some clarification on. But again, we could turn that item around quickly if that's the direction of the board. All right. All right. Uh, that's good. That's good to know. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, uh, Mr. County Minister. That's my point. Okay. Is this was a special meeting uh, with quote unquote mitigation measures being discussed. No specificity. We sort of assumed we would talk about mask mandates. My point is it's seven days yeah. until our next a policy meeting. Okay, it gives me an opportunity and all of you an opportunity to speak to staff. Maybe our staff adamantly don't want to wear masks or they feel uncomfortable being the enforcers of the mask mandate, whether it's isolated or not. It's simply judicious to wait seven days and have the discussion. And that's my point. And it's frustrating that that point gets, it keeps getting sort of hammered on, right? It's like we got seven days until our regularly scheduled meeting it is perfectly appropriate to wait those seven days. I will most likely support it, but at this point it's a principal thing, right? What is the hurry right now for this meeting that we've called? We have seven days until our next meeting. Let's give the county administrator an opportunity to put together the justification for doing that, which may, may be 100% supportable, all right? But just it's just it's appropriate to wait, and that's my point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Welch. I've got uh, Commissioner Maddox and then Commissioner Jackson to wrap it up. Just uh, uh, want, to, want to restate the motion as I'll make sure I know what I'm voting on. Uh, so motion. Commissioner Maddox, would you please restate it, sir? Commissioner Jack Jackson, it's the same motion Commissioner, Commissioner Dozier made. I'm just asking that we have back, bring back an agenda item versus approving requiring masks and county facilities today. And then the first two points from uh, Commissioner Dozier's um, motion. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Maddox. Seeing no other speakers, we'll vote on the motion at hand. Uh, all those in favor of the motion as made by uh, the substitute motion made by Commissioner Maddox and seconded by Commissioner Welch say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries uh, five to one with uh, Vice Chair Proctor out of chambers and Commissioner Dozier in dissent. All right. Any other items for the order of business? Okay. Seeing none, I just want to say a, a couple of closing remarks. Thank you all very much for being here. I, I, listen, I, I know we all care. I know we all live this day and night. Um, uh, I think we're all just trying to do the best we can in a very uncertain time under incredible pressures from, um, from areas we didn't expect. So thank you for everybody for, for being here. Thank you to the public, for all the folks who came to speak tonight. Thank you for all the folks who might be watching uh, remotely or on TV. Really grateful to have you all here. Please do everything you can to encourage those to get vaccinated and to please wear a mask indoors per CDC recommendations. Is there a motion to adjourn? All, all second, all in favor? All right, motion is adjourned. Have a good night.